Almost everyone knows about dinosaurs, those massive creatures that once roamed our planet. But few know that dinosaurs weren't the only ones who inhabited the ancient world. What animals lived 100 million years before them? Or what formidable beasts emerged 50 million years after them? In different eras, Earth was home to other enormous creatures that will amaze you just as much as the famous predators and herbivorous giants of ancient times. In this video, you will learn about the largest and most astounding animals that ever lived on land, in water, and in the air. We'll tell you about majestic marine predators capable of tearing any prey to pieces. Additionally, you will meet gigantic flying creatures whose wingspans nearly match that of an F-16 fighter jet. We'll talk about the ancestors of modern elephants and about an ancient snake that would make an anaconda seem tiny in comparison. You'll discover why it might reappear or may still be living somewhere today. You will meet giant primates that could have inspired the myths about King Kong and the Yeti. And of course, there's no way we could forget about giant dinosaurs. You will see them in a new light. Join us on a fascinating journey through the pages of terrestrial life history and discover a world known only to a very few. A world of ancient giant creatures. Giant Ancient Animals A lot of people are terrified of snakes. This is a serious issue that even has a scientific term, herpetophobia. Many people cannot stand the image of a snake and get severely traumatized when meeting even a harmless snake in the forest. It's hard to imagine what a person with such a phobia could feel when seeing a huge snake that could swallow a crocodile whole. And this is not a fairy tale character or a sketch from a horror movie. This monster really lived on our planet. Scientists discovered its remains quite recently, in 2009. Or maybe it still lives somewhere. Meet the Titanoboa, the largest and most terrible snake of all time. Now you'll get the answers to all your questions. How huge was it compared to the dinosaurs? How strong was it? Who could it kill? Why might Titanoboa reappear? And many other interesting facts. Titanoboa These were quite routine excavations conducted during the expedition of an international research group. The group was led by Jonathan Block, a vertebrate paleontologist at the University of Florida, and Carlos Jaramillo, a paleobotanist at the Smithsonian Tropical Research Institute in Panama. They were working in the Amazon basin namely in the coral mines of the Sarajon Formation in La Guajira, Colombia. Suddenly, scientists stumbled upon something extremely unusual that made quite a stir in the scientific world. The remains of ancient snakes, the size that we had never imagined before. According to preliminary calculations, it turned out that these snakes were up to 14 meters, 46 feet, or even more and weighed at least a ton. These huge snakes lived in the era of the Middle and Late Paleocene from about 60 to 58 million years ago. In fact, right after all non-avian dinosaurs went extinct. And this was no exception to the rule. In total, fossils of as many as 30 individuals were discovered. And not only vertebrae, but even three whole skulls. So there is no doubt, the pantheon of ancient giant monsters now has another terrible specimen. 
At first glance, it might seem that the 14-meter, 45.93 feet size is nothing special. Well, it's not a mile. Moreover, it's only 3 meters, 9.8 feet longer than the largest giant anaconda ever recorded, which is 11.43 meters, 37.5 feet long. But this is just at first glance. Even if you think about it without a visual illustration, the Titanoboa is a third larger than the giant anaconda. And if you look at a visual representation and compare it with a person, it becomes a little uncomfortable. Are you ready? Here's a sketchy and rather bland infographic. Here's a Titanoboa from above. It's already quite impressive how small the human figure looks, but enthusiasts have taken the trouble to recreate a full-size Titanoboa in all its glory and dimensions. One of the most famous reconstructions is at the Smithsonian Institution exhibition. Here it is. And you can see nothing special. Just a huge snake eating a crocodile. And this is not an artist's fantasy. Researchers have found plenty of fossilized skeleton parts in the Amazon basin. And they are amazing. The only thing is, we can't say anything for sure about the color. Most likely, Titanoboa had camouflage coloring, like in the modern python, a dark green shade of scales and dark angular spots throughout the body. But there's no need to guess about the sizes. Here's another comparison. Left, Titanoboa vertebrae. What's on the right? What do you think? A vertebra of a grass snake or common viper? Well, far from it. This is the vertebra of an anaconda, the largest living snake. Although dinosaurs were already extinct by that time, it would be interesting to imagine how the Titanoboa would coexist with other gigantic reptiles. Let's take one of the most recognizable and also the largest dinosaurs, the Diplodocus. According to some estimates, these monsters reached an average of 27 meters and up to 35 meters, 88.58 to 114.83 feet from the tip of the muzzle to the tip of the tail. That is, as we can see, the Titanoboa's length barely reached half of the average Diplodocus. However, their weight differed dramatically. Based on various estimates, Diplodocus weighed from 20 to 80 tons, with a mass of up to one ton. Titanoboa certainly could not compete with such a monster. To the Diplodocus, the Titanoboa was nothing more than a pipsqueak scurrying around and always getting in the way. Although, in all fairness, we should mention that the snake was still very formidable and probably reached a meter at its thickest. At most, Diplodocus probably could stumble on it. For smaller animals, on the other hand, Titanoboa would certainly mean trouble, if they were misfortunate enough to meet one. Looking at the reconstruction, it seems that this monster could swallow not only a crocodile, but a whole rhino. But was it really so? At first, scientists were sure that the Titanoboa was a top predator, and a quite ferocious and surreptitious one. Just like pythons, it could have stalked its prey, caught them off guard, put them in a deadly embrace, strangled, and then swallowed them whole. Indeed, physically, a Titanoboa was probably strong enough to break all the bones and strangle a horse-sized animal. According to various estimates, the contraction force of this snake's embrace could be as high as 30 kilograms per square centimeter. 4,000 PSI, pound per square inch. In all seriousness, it was believed that the Titanoboa had crocodilomorphs for lunch. But still, the scientific community wasn't fully unanimous on this. David Pauley, a professor at Indiana University, believed that, among other things, this huge snake ate fish. As further studies showed, the conclusions about the crocodile-eating Titanoboa were far from the truth. In fact, the Titanoboa 
was more like a blue whale or a white shark. Having a huge size, it ate every little thing, mostly fish. How did we come to this conclusion? It was none other but one of the discoverers of the Titanoboa, Jonathan Block. However, he thought so from the very beginning. In 2013, Block and colleagues published a new paper reporting the findings of Titanoboa skulls. Thanks to them, researchers could clarify the structural features of the snake's head and, hence, its diet. It turned out that the Titanoboa had many palatine and lateral teeth. Also, they weren't very durable. This means Titanoboa mostly ate relatively small animals that couldn't fight it off. But at the same time, they were slippery and nimble and prone to escape. Similar structural features were found in modern higher snakes that mainly eat fish. Based on this, the scientists concluded that the most terrible snake of all time was in fact a professional angler, relatively slow and clumsy on the ground, but quite nimble in the water. In a thriving natural environment, the Titanoboa was unlikely to have problems with food sources. With its formidable size and strength, the snake itself definitely wasn't anyone's immediate prey. But it may well have had natural enemies. For example, the giant tortoise, Carbonimus. This is suggested by the fact that the remains of these turtles are often found in swamps and lakes, alongside the remains of Titanoboas. Their shell was 1.7 meters long. They certainly didn't hunt each other, but they probably fought for food from time to time, because Carbonimus ate the same fish, and even hunted the same way using a disguise. In such fights, the Titanoboa was much less likely to win, despite being significantly larger. Titanoboa could hardly overcome the tortoise's powerful shell and crushing jaws. But no matter how formidable competitors the Carbonimus were, if the Titanoboa survived to this day, it would have to face a truly ferocious, cruel, and invincible enemy. Us. Needless to say, these giant snakes would be highly valued by luxury goods manufacturers. Snake skin products are still incredibly expensive and are in demand among the sophisticated public. Most likely, if the Titanoboa managed to survive to this day and avoid being killed off, it would be under the strictest international protection. And, due to its extreme vulnerability, it would be an exceptionally rare species on the verge of extinction. On the other hand, the habitat itself would be quite favorable, because the Titanoboa wouldn't intersect too much with people. With all its large and small bodies of water, the Amazon Basin is one of the most inaccessible places on the planet. Until now, more and more new animal species are being discovered there which we couldn't even imagine before. So maybe the Titanoboa still exists. We just haven't found it? Unfortunately, no. Such a large biological species would undoubtedly leave some traces. And over so many years of observing the area, we would have found at least the indirect signs but we only find fossilized remains that are tens of millions of years old. But no one says such monsters wouldn't appear in the future. Are you saying it's impossible? Well, it would certainly seem so. Why on earth would they reappear? But in fact, this is where it gets interesting. To understand why such monsters might appear in the future, we need to look into the past specifically at the conditions that made their emergence possible. To begin with, let's remember that giants were thriving in those days. From giant ferns to giant dragonflies, not to mention very diverse dinosaur species. Of course, we have huge whales, elephants, and sequoias now. But let's be honest, there are very few real giants. This is not even close to the number of monstrous giants who roamed the Earth for millions of years. 
But why was it so? And where did they all go? For the most part, the gigantism of certain species was caused by different factors. But as for reptiles, they have a very specific feature. Most of them are cold-blooded or poikilothermic. This term denotes animals with an unstable body temperature that changes based on the temperature of the external environment. As warm-blooded creatures, we can maintain our standard 36.6 degrees Celsius, 97.88 degrees Fahrenheit from within. Snakes, on the other hand, need the environment to provide such a temperature. That's why reptiles love to bask in the sun so much. They need heat like air. So the remains of the largest snake in the history of Earth suggest the incredibly hot tropical climate 60 million years ago. At an average temperature below 30 degrees Celsius, 86 degrees Fahrenheit, a python with the weight of a polar bear and the length of a gray whale couldn't survive and, moreover, reach such a size. Titanoboa has become another argument for scientists in proving an important fact. 58 to 60 million years ago, the average annual temperature of the tropics was probably 30 to 34 degrees Celsius, 86 to 93.2 degrees Fahrenheit. Why is that? The enzymes involved in the metabolism of almost every terrestrial organism work best at temperatures between 35 and 40 degrees Celsius, 95 to 104 degrees Fahrenheit. Naturally, the body often spends some extra energy on warming up. This means that the size of the cold-blooded creatures correlates with the average annual temperature. If we assume that Titanoboa's metabolism was similar to that of modern snakes, then it needed an average annual temperature of 30 to 34 degrees Celsius, 86 to 93.2 degrees Fahrenheit, which is 6 to 10 degrees higher than we previously thought. And what is the current situation with the climate in recent decades? That's right, global warming. We don't mean to scare anyone, but with the existing dynamics, there may well arise conditions conducive to the emergence of monsters like the Titanoboa in the future. Of course, being close to human civilization with all its harmful effects on nature would hardly help the Amazon jungle bring a new incarnation of the Titanoboa into existence. But still, according to many paleoclimatologists, the planet will witness very interesting speciation in the future. While we are waiting to see how ecosystems will change in the future, let's take a look at ancient animals that lived millions of years ago. According to one of the most compelling hypotheses, the first life on our planet appeared in the ocean. So we will start with the dwellers of the ancient ocean. The hero of the first story is Dunkley Osteus, a predator that reigned in the depths of the Devonian seas 100 million years before the dinosaurs. The genus Dunkley Ostedi includes several species. We can talk not about all of them, so let's get to know the most formidable one, Dunkley Osteus terrelli. Let's take a look at it. We have here an ancient fish with body, fins, and tail like those of fish living in the mid-water, not near the bottom. In biology, such fish are called pelagic. Pay attention to the head of the Dunkleosteus. An expert would immediately notice that it is not a plankton filter feeder or other consumer of marine minnows. The size and shape of the jaws clearly indicate it is a dangerous predator, hunter of large prey. But the most interesting thing is that these intimidating jaws do not have teeth. A toothless predator? It's hard to believe, but that's what it is. The sharp protrusions you see in the mouth of the Dunkleosteus are not teeth, but simply pointed edges of the jaw. Moreover, the shape of the jaw is such that the cutting edges are sharpened against each other when they clamp together. Not a bad design. After studying the mechanics and strength of the jaws of the Dunkleosteus, the scientists made two key conclusions. First, they found that the jaws could open so quickly that they sucked water in like a pump. 
This works well when hunting smaller prey. Second, they found that the Dunkleosteus had tremendous bite force. For example, calculations on a six meter long Dunkleosteus showed a bite force of 4,400 Newton, 989 pounds at the lateral edges of the jaws and 5,300 Newton, 1,200 pounds at the points of the central protrusions. For comparison, the bite force of a present-day polar bear is 2,570 Newton. That's half as much. A bit bewildering, isn't it? These weapons allowed the Dunkleosteus to easily deal with all but one prey. In a minute, you'll find out what this exception was and what role it played in the evolution of the Dunkleosteus. Now, let's find out its size, mass, and speed. The evidence at this point is contradictory, as the full skeleton of an adult predator has yet to be discovered. Some estimates put its length at 10 meters, 32 feet, and weight in the range of three to four tons. For the late Devonian seas, this was the largest hunter. For such a solid size, the Dunkleosteus was fairly fast. It could swim at a speed of 32 to 40 kilometers per hour, 20 to 25 miles per hour. That's a high speed for marine life of the Paleozoic era. As the largest and fastest predator, Dunkleosteus was at the top of the food chain. It preyed on amenities, sharks, plesioderms, and, and other Dunkleosteus. Yes, yes, this is the very same exception prey we mentioned above. The fact of cannibalism is scientifically proven and allows for a very interesting hypothesis. Perhaps the brutal introspective competition served as one of the main tools for the evolution of the species. The worst enemies of the Dunkleosteus were actually its brethren, so its defenses improved in this direction. Note that in the 50 million years of the species' existence, it developed nothing to protect the back half of its body. It has remained open. Hence, we can assume that this part of the body was rarely attacked, and the defense there never appeared in the process of evolution. Apparently, the Dunkleosteus attacked the victim's head when it came to assaulting its brethren. It's a rational tactic. It hit the victim's most important organs without the risk of a return bite to its unprotected part of the body. Thus, in the course of evolution, those specimens with stronger defenses of the head, the front part of the back, and the abdomen gained an advantage. As a result, we see robust and tight-fitting armor protecting these parts. They greatly increase the chances of survival in case of lateral and frontal attacks by other Dunkleosteus. Of course, this is just a hypothesis, but it is quite plausible and recognized, and other alternatives are less convincing. For example, let's imagine that the Dunkleosteus preferred to attack from the tail. What would happen with this tactic? There are few options here. Most likely the attacked Dunkleosteus would try to wriggle out and bite the aggressor's tail. It's a very interesting sight. Two predators eating each other from the tail. Thus, attacking the tail of the rival, Dunkleosteus itself risks losing its tail. In any case, it would receive serious damage in response and most likely die. It is unlikely that such a method could have taken hold in the course of evolution. What else can we say about Dunkleosteus? Judging by the facts, it was the apex marine predator of its time and was in harmony with its environment. Accordingly, its extinction must have been associated with profound changes in that environment. The extinction of Dunkleosteus at the end of the Devonian is associated with two peaks in the global extinction process. The Kelwasser event, 372 million years ago, and the Hagenberg event at the Devonian Carboniferous boundary, 359 million years ago. According to current scientists, the Hagenberg event put an end to the diversity of marine species in the Devonian seas. There is no consensus on the causes of the extinction. Various hypotheses are suggested, including such exotic ones as supernova explosion or asteroid impact. Also, there is a hypothesis that the growth of forests 
The movement of vegetation from coastal zones to the depths of the continent resulted in a lack of oxygen in the water of Devonian coastal ecosystems. It is easy to imagine the objections of the opponents of this hypothesis. It is impossible, they would say. The more forests, the more oxygen in the atmosphere. It's really so, but the point of the hypothesis is the decrease of oxygen in the water, not in the atmosphere. There was less oxygen in the coastal waters due to the increased mass of decaying organic matter. This was the result of the forests growing deep inland. They changed the structure and composition of the soil, enriching it with organics. River flow changed accordingly. River water carried a lot of organics and other substances that stimulated the growth of microalgae into marine ecosystems. As they died and decayed, they took oxygen from the water. The lack of oxygen first led to the extinction of lower links of food chains and then to the mass extinction of apex predators. In addition, sea currents may have changed during this period and a large amount of hydrogen sulfide from deep waters entered coastal waters. The mystery of the extinction of Dunkleosteus is still waiting to be solved. Today, one thing is known for sure. A magnificent apex predator, perfectly adapted to natural conditions, completely disappeared from our planet. The hero of our next story, Doriaspis, also lived in the ocean depths of the early Devonian about 415 to 395 million years ago. Doriaspis was a jawless fish with an unusual body shape its remains were first discovered by Swedish phytopaleontologist Alfred Gabriel Nathorst during an expedition in 1882. Two years later, the find was studied and described by British zoologist Edwin Ray Lancaster. He also gave the Doriaspis its first name, Scapespis Nathorsti. In the 20th century, a British geologist, Errol Ivor White, began to study the curious fish. He completed the classification of the new species, and it had to be named somehow. White noticed that the outline of the fish looks like a combination of a spear and a shield. Taking the Greek names for these objects, he gave the ancient fish the name Doriaspis. Of course, we cannot say that this prehistoric fish was more terrifying than a dinosaur, at least because of its negligible size. According to available data, its length did not exceed 15 centimeters, 6 inches. Nor can we say today how dangerous it was, but it did look very intimidating. It had a strange body. The surface of the upper part of the body resembles a tortoise shell, and the belly is flat and smooth. The tail of the Doriaspis is long, flat, and thin, with spines on the edges. There are two long, almost round, bony protrusions extending from the sides of the body. In some species, the protrusions resembled fins or wings and had serrations along the edges. The purpose of these outgrowths is unknown. Perhaps they helped the fish to float and balance in the midwater. However, their shape is far from that of a wing so this hypothesis is not widely supported by paleobiologists. According to other versions, the lateral protrusions serve for species recognition and also as a specific tool for digging up silt. It is difficult to assess the plausibility of these options because it is still not clear what mode of life Doriaspis had. It is not proven that this fish was pelagic, that is, lived in the midwater but there is no evidence that it lived in the sediment area either. It is difficult to determine the function and purpose of any part of the body of an unusual fish unless we know how and where this fish lived and how and what it fed on. This is not good for science, but you can give free rein to your imagination. Try to suggest your own version of the purpose of the lateral protrusion. Who knows? Maybe your hypothesis will push science forward. By the way, in the case of Doriaspis, this is not the only area for your hypothesis. The point is that the situation with the purpose of the central spike, or in scientific terms, rostrum, is not clearer. 
There is no unanimous opinion as to what Doriaspis needed it for or how it was used either. It is noteworthy that, unlike in the case of modern fishes, the spike is located under the mouth, and this is quite rational, the fish could throw up the bottom sediment with the spike. Thus, the fish immediately got all sorts of things thrown up from the body before its eyes and mouth. If there is something tasty, it could be quickly devoured. Remember that in the cruel world of natural selection, eating faster means being more efficient and having a better chance of survival. There is logic in such an explanation, but again it all comes down to the lack of data. What if Doriaspis was actually a pelagic fish that lived not on the bottom, but in the midwater? Then the whole reasoning is useless. Unfortunately, there are far more questions than answers. We know too little about this strange fish. We believe that the main discoveries on Doriaspis are yet to come. The subject of our next story is also partly connected with the evolution of life on Earth. In this story, we will present you not just one, as usual, but two ancient creatures, Mesosaurus and Mosasaurus. Their names are very similar, which sometimes leads to confusion, despite the fact that these predators were very different from each other. In addition to external differences, one of them is also famous for its special role in science. Further, you will learn which one of them has helped science and how. So let's talk about Mosasaurus. It was a very large sea predator. It is classified as a reptile from the order Squamata. Family, Mosasauridae. Genus, Mosasaurus. According to this classification, five species of Mosasaurus are known today. We describe the species Mosasaurus hofmani, and everything that will be further described about Mosasaurus is about it. Mosasaurus lived in the Cretaceous period of the Mesozoic era, about 145 to 66 million years ago. Fossilized traces of their existence have been found on all continents, including Antarctica. They inhabited warm, shallow seas that were widespread in the late Cretaceous. These ancient sea lizards were warm-blooded, the viperous, with a high metabolic rate. An adult Mosasaurus could exceed 10 meters, 32 feet in length, and weighed up to 70 tons. Their average lifespan was about 42 years. Mosasaurus fed on bony fish, cephalopods, sharks, and marine reptiles. Sea turtles were its main prey. In the last 20 million years of the Cretaceous period, Mosasaurus drove out all their competitors represented by large mackerel sharks, the last pliosaurs, and earned the title of the top sea predator of their time. Mosasaurus became extinct about 66 million years ago, along with dinosaurs and petrosaurs in a mass extinction at the end of the Cretaceous period. As apex predators, they significantly influenced the evolution of many sea animal species. Notably, the evolution of Mosasaurus gives us useful information about another interesting process. We know that the ancestors of the Mosasaurus lived on land, so the evolution of this predator helps us understand how the transition of a reptile group to an aquatic habitat occurred. Now let's talk about Mesosaurus. Mesosaurus fossilized remains have been found in early Permian sediments, these sediments were formed 299 to 271 million years ago, so scientists believe that Mesosaurus lived in this period. It had neither impressive size nor weight. It was only about a meter, 3.3 feet long, and it fed on small crustaceans and other minnows. A seemingly unremarkable, humble saurian, but it played an important role in the history of Earth science. An important fact was that Mesosaurus lived in fresh water. It could not stay long in salt water, respectively, it could not cross the ocean. Another important point, Mesosaurus appeared almost simultaneously in South Africa and South America. The German meteorologist 
Alfred Wengener drew attention to these details. Knowing that Mesosaurus could not cross the ocean, Wengener decided that Africa and South America were once a single whole. On this basis, he proposed a theory of the continent's origin as a result of the splitting of an early supercontinent into several parts. Wengener published his hypothesis in 1912. Later, this idea, after thorough revision, turned into the modern theory of tectonic plate movement. This is how Mesosaurus from ancient times influenced modern science in a very unexpected area. This is its role in science, which we promise to tell you about. You have to admit, we have a lot to commend the humble freshwater lizard for. Now, let's move from the ocean to land and get to know amazing and fearsome creatures that lived after the dinosaurs. In the late 1880s, paleontologists Carlos Siriaco Amenguino and Francisco Pascaquillo Marino reported to the world the existence of Forest Rosidae, ancient flightless birds. This fact led to the realization that the entire history of flightless birds is like an iceberg. The few species that live now are just the tip. Most of this iceberg is hidden in the past, and part of the hidden history was the giant Forest Rocos, which appeared in the Paleogene after the extinction of the dinosaurs. In total, there are about 20 known species of them. Forest Rocos roamed South America about 62 million years ago until the mid-Pleistocene, about 1.3 million years ago. An adult Forosakos reached 2.5 meters, about 8 feet in height, and weighed 150 kilograms, 330 pounds on average. It had a large head and a bulky beak flattened on the sides. The end of the beak had the shape of a large hook. The ancient bird leaned on powerful legs with large claws on its toes. These details unambiguously indicate the predatory mode of life of these birds. Thanks to their long, muscular legs, Porosakos were able to stalk and chase their prey long and efficiently. They were key predators in South America during its long geographic isolation. About 2.7 million years ago, North and South America united. The faunas of the continents began to blend and the Farasakos gained competitors. The invaders were stronger, so the local predators lost to them and gradually became extinct. One of the Farasakos, Titan's wallery, tried to escape. This species made it to North America on foot, but even there a cruel fate befell it. The remains of this species were found in the south of the USA. Today, Forosakos is of interest not only as a bird that lived millions of years ago. This species is of great value as a result of development in isolation. One must agree that a bird that abandoned flying is an interesting evolutionary experiment. There are still debates about the reasons for this, and they may have a very interesting conclusion. The fact is that natural selection plays a major role in evolution. In a highly simplified form, it works as follows. Features that are useful for survival and reproduction are strengthened, while harmful ones eventually disappear along with their bearers. They simply die out. The main mechanism here is random mutations, due to which features appear or disappear, and natural selection only reinforces the successful version. The role of natural selection in evolution is well known. So the question is, what was wrong with Pharosakos? We know for sure that it had no competitors, which would have caused it to give up flying. So why did its wings diminish greatly in the course of evolution? Why did it stop flying? It wasn't easy to find a reason, but it was found. It has to do with the behavior of these huge birds. They didn't need to fly to find food, to reproduce effectively. They didn't want to fly just to admire the terrain from above. Flying may be a pleasant activity, 
but it is very energy consuming and potentially risky. The last two arguments were decisive and gradually led to the Farosakos to give up flying completely. The wings of the Farosakos remained, but gradually shrank to a size useful in an exclusively terrestrial life. Natural selection, of course, did not disappear. It helped the flightless bird to get powerful legs and other features that allowed it to excel without flying. Farosakos became extinct around the middle of the Pleistocene, about 1.3 million years ago. Their closest present-day relatives are Cerimas, two species of land birds of prey in South America. Their long, slim legs are only a faint echo of the former glory of their mighty ancestor. The biography of Forusrakos tells us that after the dinosaurs, the birds managed to adapt to a purely terrestrial life. And there were even territories where they ranked as the dominant predators. This is certainly an amazing transformation. But you're probably wondering, what happened to the sky? Did all descended to the ground and the sky stayed empty after the paradoctyls became extinct? Now, you'll learn who got the reins of the sky after the flying lizards. Meet Argentavis. According to modern data, Argentavis lived in the territory of modern Argentina during the Miocene Epoch, about 23 to 5.3 million years ago. This means that in terms of time and place, its biography overlaps with the biography of the hero of our previous story, Horus Rakos. Argentivus was about twice the size of the largest flying bird of today, the Andean condor. Argentivus had a wingspan of about 7 meters, which is only 3 meters less than that of the famous F-16 fighter. In terms of size, it could have rivaled the Pizarras, but those had died out long before its appearance. Argentivus weighed between 70 and 72 kilograms, 154 and 159 pounds. The height or distance from the ground to the top of the standing bird reached 180 centimeters, 6 feet. Just imagine yourself next to such a birdie. You've probably started to wonder how such a giant even took off. How high and how long could it fly? Research in this area has led to interesting conclusions. It turns out that the pectoral muscles and this is the main power machine of flight, of Argentivus were smaller than those of other flying birds in percentage terms. This means only one thing. Argentivus could not stay in the air for long, continuous flapping its huge wings. Most likely, Argentivus relied on air currents and flapped its wings only during the takeoff and landing phases. Thus, the large wings helped it to stay in the sky as long as necessary relying on the rising air currents. In addition, such wings made it possible not only to soar in the sky, but also to fly effortlessly in any direction. To do this, Argentivus gained altitude in the rising currents and then glided down in the desired direction. As a result, Argentivus could fly long distances with almost no wasted energy. This is an extremely energy efficient type of flight that is used by glider pilots today. Takeoff was the most difficult task, as its huge wings inevitably touched the ground as it flapped. It probably relied on air currents here as well. It could run towards the wind so that lift force was generated and then use its strong legs to jump up into the air. Argentivus might also have used a jump from the top of some hill to take off. Now it's time to understand why it flew. I hope none of you have been confused by this question. Apparently, it flew to get food, and scientists have found out what kind of prey it was looking for. It is recognized that Argentivus was carnivorous, but it was not an active predator. That is, it did not attack and kill. It had an inappropriate body shape and relatively weak pectoral muscles for this purpose. The most likely behavior for Argentivus was that of a scavenger. The life of a scavenger is much more relaxed. 
and success there is achieved through fewer energy waste. As for competitors, they were small mammalian scavengers unable to confront Argentivas due to its size. It is not difficult to answer the question of who provided it with prey. Let's just remember that the main predators of Miocene South America were flightless birds, Horus rachidae, which we have just described. They could easily destroy large prey, and perhaps it was these predators that provided the large amounts of carrion that helped Argentivus to survive. It only needed between 2.5 and 5 kilograms, 5.5 to 11 pounds, of meat each day. For its size, that's a relatively small amount. So what do we have in the end? Argentivus had no threats in the air. It could hover safely for hours and wait for its flightless counterpart to leave him something for lunch. And it was satisfied with little, thanks to its amazing energy efficiency. Low food consumption and special mode of hunting of Argentivus led paleontologists to the hypothesis that this bird was also relatively long-lived. It is now believed that its lifespan amounted to at least several decades. Thus, Argentivus survived, according to the so-called K strategy. Let's explain a little bit what that is. The K strategy is living within the boundaries of one's ecosystem without changing numbers. The number of specimens is determined by the food reserves in the ecosystem. With this strategy, a small, stable population of scavengers has a good chance of survival. Argentivus laid one or two eggs every two years, so it had few nestlings. According to the K strategy, they stayed with their parents until they learned to find food on their own. With this reproductive rate, the number of other species did not increase, but neither did it decrease, since Argentivus died mostly from old age and diseases. Other causes accounted for no more than 2% of the death rate. Although Argentivus was undoubtedly a successful predator, this did not save the species from extinction. It did not survive to the Pliocene, and today only fossils of millions of years old prove its existence. At this point, we finish talking about flying and non-flying prehistoric birds. It's time to move on to the most interesting animals after the dinosaurs, the mammals. One of the most interesting ones is Platybelodon. It belongs to the genus of Gomphotherium, extinct proboscidean, relatives of modern elephants. They lived in Africa, Eurasia, and North America during the Miocene and Pliocene eras more than 15 million years ago. In the Pleistocene epoch, after the merger of North and South America, the faunas of the continents mixed and the Great American Interchange took place. And so, Gomphotherium got to South America as well. The only territories they couldn't reach were Australia and Antarctica. Gomphotherium reached the peak of its diversity in the late Miocene and became extinct in the Pleistocene. Externally, the Platybelodon looked very much like an elephant. It had two upper and two lower tusks, but unlike modern elephants, its upper tusks were bent downwards. Science doesn't know the reason for this, although there must be a reason. We know that evolution doesn't tolerate useless things. However, the upper tusks are not the most interesting thing about Platybelodon. These bizarre mammals became known for their two tusks on the lower jaw. They were without enamel, broad, and flattened horizontally, which gave them a resemblance to the blade of a bayonet shovel. In 1936, when describing Asian specimens of the genus Platybelodon, the famous paleontologist Henry Fairfield Osborne was the first to compare the lower pair of tusks to a coal shovel. The comparison became firmly rooted, and Platybelodon has since been often referred to as a shovel-tusked Gomphotherium. Today, of all the proboscideans, Gomphotherium still remains the most popular object of study for paleontologists. The main mystery of Platybelodon is the purpose of the shovel-shaped armament of the lower jaw. Presumably, it has something to do with feeding, but it is not known exactly how it was used. 
Accordingly, it is not clear what the Platybelodon fed on. It was assumed that the lower tusks were used as a shovel for digging and raking plants. There was also a version of cutting leaves off branches from trees. Another hypothesis was raking algae from the bottom of the freshwater lakes. There was also an opposite conclusion. Platybelodon did not use its bone shovels at all when eating. But the hypothesis of a shovel for algae was supported by a lot of scientists. Specific wear, which was explained by the abrasive effect of sand and clay on the shoals, supported it. This is how he was drawn everywhere, digging in aquatic and coastal vegetation. After this hypothesis, it would seem everything calmed down, disputes quieted. But in 1992, the scientific world was shaken up by the work of paleontologist David Lambert. According to the results of the study with the use of modeling, he concluded the lower jaw cut bark and branches. Later, having examined the micro layer of the surface of the tusk shovels, the Chinese scientist came to the same conclusion. Moreover, they noted that adult platybelodons ate coarser food. Well, it looks like it's time to depict platybelodons at lunch in a dense tropical forest. Although, we cannot say for sure that the search for the truth has come to an end. Finally, we invite you to learn about the fascinating discovery story of another predator that lived in Central Asia during the mid and late Eocene Epoch, about 45 to 36 million years ago. The world learned about Andrew Sarsius from a skull discovered in Mongolia. It was found by an expedition led by the American scientist, paleontologist Roy Chapman Andrews in Inner Mongolia in 1923. The skull was found in the Erdin Manga sediments formed at the end of the Mid-Eocene. At first it was thought that the skull belonged to a giant suiforms from the Entelodonte group. These are extinct mammalian predators with a body resembling a bull and a head resembling a boar. We immediately recall the ancient Greek myths about the Minotaur, right? However, this hypothesis didn't last long. A year later, the above-mentioned paleontologist Henry Fairfield Osborne determined the found skull belonged to a predator from the family Mesonychidae. He also described the new predator and named it Andrew Sarchus in honor of Roy Andrews, the head of the expedition that found the skull. When reconstructing Andrusarchus, it was found that its body length was 3.8 to 4.5 meters, 12.5 to 13.1 feet, and its tail was 1.5 meters, 5 feet long. The weight of this ancient predator could have exceeded a ton, 2,200 pounds. Considering that it had a skull 83 centimeters, 2.7 feet long, and 56 centimeters, 0.85 feet wide, we can consider Andrew Sarchus the largest terrestrial carnivorous mammal that ever lived. There is something mystical about the look of the Andrew Sarchus. Look at this beast. What does it remind you of? Think of horror movies about werewolves. There is a certain resemblance, right? It is safe to say that in terms of frightening appearance, it was a worthy heir to the Tyrannosaurus. There is one unpleasant thing about the story of Andrew Sarchus. Almost a hundred years have passed since the skull was found, but nothing else has ever been discovered. Excavations are continuing all over the world, but there are no more skulls, let alone a whole skeleton. It's pretty strange and brings up some thoughts. Maybe there was no such species. Maybe it was the skull of some Anomalous Sonichidae, another extinct mammal, which is far less mysterious. Of course, this can't be a final conclusion. But not a single bone in 100 years? There is definitely plenty of food for thought. After speculating about the mysterious Androsorcus, let's talk about animals that are better studied, but are no less impressive. Mammoths. Firstly, 
It's worth noting right away that mammoths were far more diverse than a single biological species. When we hear the word mammoths, our minds typically picture woolly giants with enormous tusks. However, in reality, these creatures varied significantly depending on their habitat and the development stage of this entire mammal genus. The sizes of individual species varied dramatically. For example, North America was fortunate enough to be the homeland for the largest species, Mammothus imperator, or the imperial mammoth. It was 16.40 feet tall and weighed 14 tons. At the other end of the spectrum were the dwarf mammoths, Mammothus exilus and Mammothus lamarmorae, who barely exceeded 6 feet in height and weighed up to 2,000 pounds. The most prevalent mammoth species were roughly the same size as today's elephants. However, they certainly differed in appearance and body structure from their modern-day cousins. Compared to elephants, mammoths had bulkier bodies, shorter legs, and long fur. Those are the most striking differences. Another distinctive feature was their large curved tusks. Modern elephants can only dream of having such huge tusks. They always steal the spotlight when it comes to mammoths. So we are going to explore this feature in more detail in a moment. On the contrary, their ears were relatively humble in size and were much smaller than those of elephants. Mammoth's ears were five to six times smaller than those of an Asian elephant and 15 to 16 times smaller than those of an African elephant. Moreover, the ears lay flat against their skulls. Interestingly, people often overlook this feature, focusing only on the thick fur and prominent tusks. In fact, the shape of a mammoth's ear is more akin to a human ear than to an elephant's. The skeletal structure of ancient mammoths closely resembles that of the modern-day Indian elephant. The most distinctive feature is, of course, adult mammoths' gigantic tusks. They were up to about 16 feet long and weighed as much as 220 pounds. The tusks were in the upper jaw, growing forward, curving upwards, and extending outward. We'll discuss tusks in more detail shortly, as it's one of the most fascinating subjects of research. Tusks are essentially modified incisors, growing at the front of the skull and pointing upwards. Even at birth, baby mammoths already had miniature tusklets reaching a few inches long. These started to emerge from the alveoli or gums at about six months of age. They were barely visible on the baby's face. The baby tusks would eventually be replaced by the adult ones when the mammoths reached about one year old. In the first six to seven years of a young mammoth's life, the tusks grew at an accelerated rate, much like the rest of their body. By the time males were 10 years old, their tusks could be three to four feet long, with a diameter of up to four inches. This growth subsequently tapered off, but by the time males reached 20 to 25 years of age, their tusks could measure six to seven feet in length and five inches in diameter at the alveolus edge. Old males aged 60 to 65 years had tusks as long as 11 to 13 feet and a diameter of six to seven inches at the alveolus. In females, it was six to seven feet and three to four inches respectively. Scientists can deduce some facts about the life of an adult individual by the size of the tusks and their annual rings. What? Did mammoth tusks have annual rings like trees? Surprisingly, the answer is yes. And they also can reveal some valuable information. At the very least, scientists can accurately determine the animal's age at the time of death by counting the rings on a cross section. Based on the size of the tusks, Scientists can even determine how many offspring a female might have borne, although this requires some sophisticated equipment. Interestingly, mammoth tusks generally curved upward and to the sides, with the left tusk usually growing toward the right one, and the right tusk toward the left. In other words, 
In adult specimens, the tusks appeared to face each other. Such positioning was usually found in males. At the base, a tusk was about 7 to 7.5 inches in diameter. Mammoths often used their tusks for essential survival tasks, like self-defense or digging through snow in search of food. As a result, examinations of tusk specimens have revealed cracks and chips, as well as signs of wear and tear on the outer edge. Given how massive the tusks were, one might wonder how they were attached to the skull and how their base could fit into it. In this regard, they actually have a lot in common with modern elephants. The mammoth's nostrils were positioned high on the forehead, approximately at eye level, resembling the structure of a whale's skull. The brain was nested deep beneath the frontal sinuses, extending inwards up to 12 to 13 inches. This design provided ample space for securely anchoring the tusks. Mammoth tusks are still regularly found to this day. Millennia spent underground have often led to fascinating mineralization processes, imbuing the tusks with various shading rings from light brown to emerald, blue, purple, and even black. So we now know for certain that mammoths had, unsurprisingly, massive column-like legs and round feet. The foot diameter varied, ranging from 5 to 6 inches in one-year-old calves to 18 to 20 inches in older males. They had three, rarely four, nail-shaped hooves in the front and rear legs. The hooves were 3 to 4 inches long and 1.37 to 1.57 inches high. The soles of their feet were exceptionally sturdy, over 2 inches thick. Much like modern elephants, the mammoths had feet equipped with elastic cushions of connective tissue that acted as shock absorbers. When the load increased, they expanded the support area, and when it decreased, they reduced it, thus helping to move on thawing over-moistened soils. The next point is, of course, the fur. Here, too, the scientists were lucky enough to find some well-preserved samples. There are many finds that allow us to restore the features of the mammoth's fur. In the most common mammoth species, it was light brown or yellowish brown. The fur on the flanks almost reached the ground, resembling a skirt. The animal's head featured a fringe-like headpiece of stiff, tangled hair, 6 to 6.7 inches long. It covered the animal's crown, descending to the eyes and the base of the trunk. Most importantly, mammoth's fur was thick, dense, and had three layers. The stiffest guard layer, or overhair, was on top, followed by on hairs, and finally undercoat, or downy hairs. It's quite obvious these prehistoric inhabitants of the far north had a very warm coat. In general, we must admit that all these numerous paintings, illustrations, and reconstructions are visually accurate. Mammoths looked exactly like that. First, let's talk about the diet. The mammoth was a dedicated vegetarian. Its main diet consisted of herbaceous plants, tree shoots, small shrubs, and moss. But when it comes to their daily consumption rate, the word impressive barely scratches the surface. A staggering 550 pounds of plant matter was needed simply to sustain the mammoth. This required them to spend about 18 hours a day foraging, constantly changing their location in search of fresh pastures. The animal's diet included rough food, which can be inferred from its dental structures. Despite their enormous size, mammoths had only a couple of molar teeth, which helped them grind plant matter. Much like modern elephants, the mammoth had only one, but a very large tooth, on each side of the upper and lower jaws. During the tooth change period, there were two of them. The mammoth tooth had quite a unique structure, it resembled a grater, composed of separate enamel-coated plates. Such a tool allowed for coping with the roughest plant food. What was also surprising is that over the course of their lifetime, each half of the mammoth's jaw would cycle through six teeth, the first three being milk teeth and the last three being permanent root teeth. The last root tooth 
weighed up to three to four kilograms. The herbivorous nature of mammoths largely determined their behavior and social aspects. Mammoths generally lived in herds, a typical evolutionary adaptation that helps herbivores protect themselves from predators and collectively solve feeding issues. Based on a massive body of fossil evidence, scientists have determined that these herds were often led by a matriarch, usually an older female. While males contributed to the herd's defense, they mostly lived separately. Young males formed subgroups and stayed in smaller herds. Each of the subgroups was headed by the dominant male, although it remained under the overarching authority of the matriarch. She was the one who guided the herd and set its course, followed by all herd members. Within the herd, a deep sense of kinship prevailed. Adult females, held in high regard by their peers, often looked after the young of others. These small groups moved around in search of food. During seasonal migrations, these groups would come together to form a larger herd and consume all the vegetation they found along the way. Overall, the life of a mammoth was an endless feast and an equally endless quest for new grazing lands. Unlike many other mammals, mammoth calves took a long time to become fully independent. They reached sexual maturity at around 10 years of age. At this point, there were some significant changes in their lives and behavior. And this brings us to the fascinating subject of mammoth reproduction. An international group of scientists recently studied the right tusk of a male mammoth who lived approximately 35,000 years ago. They discovered evidence of sharp seasonal surges in testosterone levels. Similar events occur in the lives of modern elephants. This happens during a period known as musht, a phase marked by dangerous behavior in young male elephants. Musht refers to a specific state a male elephant experiences during the mating season. During this period, a surge in testosterone levels triggers drastic behavioral changes. A wild male elephant in must regularly emits a unique low-frequency sound that can be heard by elephants of both sexes tens of kilometers away. This sound attracts some females who trumpet as they rush towards him. Conversely, males not in must as well as uninterested females tend to avoid such sounds. This may be because male elephants in must are quite dangerous. For instance, they may attack human villages, damage property, or even kill rhinos. Recent research suggests that mammoths also experienced must. This had significant implications for their interactions with other species that lived at the time, including even humans, who, in all likelihood, didn't like their giant neighbors. If the roar of a modern elephant can be heard for dozens of miles, one could only imagine the sound an imperial mammoth could make. According to the study published in Nature, scientists used liquid chromatography and tandem mass spectrometry to measure testosterone concentrations in the tusks of a male mammoth aged 33 to 38 and a modern male African elephant. It turned out that both species exhibit striking annual spikes in testosterone levels throughout their adult lives. However, their intensity was different. During the spikes, elephants' testosterone levels increased by 20 times compared to a 10-time increase in mammoths. Researchers attribute this variance to the degradation of testosterone in the preserved tusk over tens of thousands of years since the death of the male mammoth. Nevertheless, even tenfold spikes in testosterone levels are enough. They directly suggest that male mammoths went through musts. At the same time, a test conducted on a tusk from a female mammoth that lived on Wrangell Island 5,500 to 6,000 years ago showed no such spikes in testosterone. In other words, female mammoths did not experience must, and neither do modern female elephants. Nowadays, domestic male elephants in must are typically restrained with deeply embedded male stakes to prevent destruction. In the case of wild male African elephants, 
it is necessary to ensure that there are older males in the herd near the younger ones. These older males tend to mitigate the violent tendencies of the younger ones in musk, which prevents them from killing rhinos and other destructive behavior. It's quite possible that older individuals also exerted such an influence on young mammoths. Overall, mammoths lived in a rather favorable ecological niche. This is evidenced by the fact that they managed to populate most of the northern part of our planet. Mammoths thrived for hundreds of thousands and even millions of years. But why aren't we now making exciting documentaries about these amazing creatures, instead of studying their fossilized remains? What really happened? How and why did the mammoths go extinct? Even when it comes to dinosaur extinction theories, where it would be easier to pin everything on the asteroid, there's no consensus among scientists as to the most defining factor. Likewise, we can't identify a single cause for the mammoth's extinction, especially considering the fact that the last populations only died out about 4,000 years ago. This is merely a blink of an eye by evolutionary standards. The Egyptian pyramids had already been standing for 500 years by then, so what prevented mammoths from surviving to the present day? After all, there were no ice ages or any sort of global disasters that could have wiped out an entire species. In reality, the extinction of mammoths was due to multiple factors and occurred in several stages. Naturally, the last stage was the most tragic. Stay tuned to discover the terrible suffering these animals had to endure before eventually vanishing from Earth. Consider the following image. A group of mammoths is attempting to fend off a polar bear. However, something about this scene seems out of proportion, doesn't it? Look at the sizes of the mammoths and the bear. It appears as if the mammoth family has stumbled upon some gigantic predator. A polar bear the size of a mammoth. In fact, what happened here was quite the opposite. The bear in the picture is of modern size, while the mammoths are mere dwarfs. They stood only two heads taller than a modern human and weighed no more than three tons, contrasting sharply with the standard six to eight ton weight of a male mammoth. Such a scene could have occurred just about 4,000 years ago on Wrangell Island, the last refuge of mammoths on the planet. Soon after such hypothetical encounters, the mammoths vanished completely. But what led to their ultimate demise? The peak of the mammoth extinction was just a small part of the mass extinction of large mammals during the Quaternary period. This period coincided with the end of the last ice age, approximately 15,000 years ago. Roughly 5,000 years later, mammoths had almost entirely vanished. There were some extremely small populations, but they too had no chance of surviving due to the unfortunate and unforeseeable reasons which we'll explore in a moment. The primary reason cited for the downfall of these woolly giants is climate change, which drastically reduced mammoth-friendly habitats. The extinction of mammoths was not sudden. It took thousands of years and occurred unevenly across their vast geographic range. For example, the last Spanish mammoth lived almost 19,000 years ago. Mammoths disappeared from Great Britain about 12,000 years ago. And the last mainland mammoth population on Earth, living in northern Chukotka, ceased to exist about 9,000 years ago. Tiny mammoth populations remained on isolated islands, for example, on St. Paul Island off the coast of Alaska, mammoths lived up to 5,600 years ago. The last mammoths on Earth roamed the shores of Wrangell Island about 4,000 years ago. They lived until the rise of the earliest human civilizations and the construction of the Great Pyramid of Giza in ancient Egypt. Following the end of the Ice Age, Rising sea levels severed the mammoth's connection to the mainland. This isolation led to a reduction in mammoth sizes. 
The phenomenon of island dwarfism is well documented in both modern animals and the paleontological record. It serves as a classic example of how populations adapt to limited resources. In the long term, it's easier for evolution to shrink an individual's body size than to find new food sources for it. Thus, the mammoth became smaller. However, dwarfism was not the most severe consequence of isolation, nor were the harsh winds that prevented the transition from open tundra to forested landscapes. Even humans were inculpable as they first arrived on the island about 3,000 years ago. The actual cause was different. The small area of the island, which was almost three square miles, couldn't support a large population of big animals. There simply couldn't be many of them. Limited space led to severe inbreeding with this isolated community. As a result of prolonged inbreeding, the already tiny population of around 300 Wrangell Island mammoths suffered significant losses in genetic diversity. Harmful mutations began to accumulate. According to genetic sequencing results, the local mammoths had many more deletions or instances of DNA damage compared to their mainland cousins. A whole set of genes, including those related to olfactory receptors and urinary proteins, became essentially non-functional. For example, some typical mutations were observed in gene FOXQ1 of island mammoths. In laboratory mice, they led to the formation of thin, translucent hairs and the disrupted secretion of some gastrointestinal tract substances. If the FOXQ1 gene mutation had similar effects in mammoths, it would mean that the animals not only suffered from digestive issues, but also had less dense and coarser fur. It would have provided less insulation against harsh Arctic winds. The fur could quickly become wet under the snow, potentially leading to hypothermia-induced death. But all of this is just a fraction of the terrible consequences that accumulated and manifested with each successive generation. Further research into the mutated genes of Wrangell Island mammoths revealed even more destructive effects of prolonged isolation. By restoring mammoth DNA fragments in the genomes of laboratory animals, scientists discovered serious abnormalities in genes associated with developmental defects. HYLS1, low sperm count in seminal fluid, reduced male fertility, NKD1, and even diabetes, NeuroG3. It's quite likely that the mammoths on Wrangell Island were doomed from the moment they became isolated. The reason is that the minimum population size needed to maintain genetic diversity is generally considered to be 500 individuals. For Asian elephants, the woolly mammoth's closest modern relatives, a viable population is considered to be between 216 and 4,700 individuals. This means the Wrangell Island mammoth population was dangerously close to the extinction threshold. Due to reduced genetic diversity, harmful mutations became fixed in the genome. And sooner or later, this led to complete mutational degeneration. Unfortunately, it's impossible to say for sure today whether the mutational crisis was the primary factor in the eventual extinction of the mammoths. Some researchers believe that the collapse of the Wrangell Island population could have been caused by catastrophic events or hunting by ancient humans, whose arrival on the island roughly coincides with the extinction of mammoths. The latter possibility brings to mind the iconic image of Neanderthals driving mammoths into traps. This has become such an ingrained stereotype that many people are convinced that humans were the primary cause of the mammoth's demise. However, the reality is much more complicated. Most mammoth remains were discovered in Russian Siberia, simply because it was their largest habitat. The permafrost of Siberia, as well as similar climactic zones in Canada, have yielded more than just skeletal remains, but several mummified carcasses of young mammoths. 
In May 2007, a reindeer herder discovered an astonishingly well-preserved frozen mammoth calf on the Yamal Peninsula, near the upper reaches of the Uribe River. The skin, trunk, and all other body parts were absolutely intact. The calf named Leuba, in honor of the herder's wife, became a real gift for mammoth experts worldwide. According to experts, the mammoth calf was female and died at about one month of age, approximately 42,000 years ago. Its torso measured 3 by 4.26 feet and weighed 66 pounds. Numerous studies by specialists from Russia, Japan, the US, France, and the Netherlands confirmed that the mammoth calf didn't suffer from any diseases or malnutrition during its life. On the contrary, it had a pronounced hump of fat reserves and intact skeletal bones. However, its oral cavity and respiratory tracts were filled with silt and mud, suggesting she died after falling into a water body and inhaling sediment. Though only a month old and still nursing from her mother, Lyuba's intestines also contained seeds, pollen, spores, and plant remains, which helped identify the nature of the water body as lightly marshy, as well as the terrain as a tundra-like landscape. For the first time, a somewhat unsettling discovery was made thanks to the study of Lyuba's stomach and intestinal contents. Like modern elephants, young mammoths consume their mother's feces to create the right bacterial environment in their digestive systems. Also, for the first time, scientists confirmed that shortly after birth, and possibly even in utero, mammoths develop a pronounced neck hump with brown fat reserves, which served as a thermoregulator. According to scientists, Lyuba, the baby mammoth, belonged to the branch of mammoths that migrated to North America along the existing land bridge before eventually returning. Interestingly, Lyuba was the second completely preserved mammoth ever discovered. So, who was the first? Let's find out. In the distant year of 1977, the world of archaeology was shaken by an unprecedented discovery. A team of gold miners accidentally discovered a mummified animal in the USSR in the Magadan region near the Dima stream in the Kergiliak River Valley. While excavating a potential gold deposit, a bulldozer operator unearthed an unusual brownish-red object. Upon closer inspection of the find, it became evident that he had stumbled upon a unique animal carcass. Scientists were promptly notified and arrived as soon as they could. Almost immediately, it turned into a global sensation for the first time in the history of science, a fully preserved mammoth body had been discovered. Further study revealed that the baby mammoth was a malnutritious male nearing weaning age. Its shoulder height was about 3 feet. The carcass weighed about 154 pounds. Taking into account the moisture loss from freezing, its estimated live weight could have been as much as 220 pounds. Initially, the find was covered in fur, but most of it had been lost. Unfortunately, the carcass had not been handled very carefully before the scientists arrived. Without its fur, the animal appeared to have long legs, but the hind limbs were noticeably shorter than the front. The first amateur photographs show that long fur covered the legs from the knees to the soles of the feet. There was also fur on the left cheek and trunk, left side, and shoulder. Unfortunately, by the time the specimen arrived at the regional center, only isolated strands of hair remained. According to witnesses, much of the fur was taken by souvenir hunters in the early days. About three pounds of fur was collected by scientists from the soil at the site where the baby mammoth was found. Scientists calculated that the young mammoth died in August or September and was only six to seven months old at that time. The well-developed fur coat indicates that the animal had quickly grown its fur during the brief summer to withstand the harsh winter. Unfortunately, it wasn't destined to survive even its first winter. And thousands of years later, the same fate would befall all of its kind. Which leaves us wondering, 
What would the world be like if mammoths hadn't gone extinct? What would happen if they had continued to live among us? Our initial answer to this question may disappoint many. Nothing. Absolutely nothing special would have happened. Most people would hardly be in awe of these animals. We would likely take their existence for granted. At first, people would most definitely hunt them for their tough but edible meat, durable hides and valuable tusks. Then, realizing its mistake, humanity would shift towards conserving mammoths. But this wouldn't stop poachers, just as the protected status of white rhinos hasn't stopped them before. On March 19, 2018, a male northern white rhinoceros named Sudan was euthanized due to severe illness. He was the last male northern white rhino on Earth. As harsh as it sounds, it's plausible that mammoths could have faced a similar fate. And while we are waiting for new technologies to bring back mammoths, let's travel back to the times of another aquatic monster, Megalodon. In accordance with modern terminology, we can say that Megalodon lived in the Cenozoic era, during the Neogene. The oldest fossils of its teeth are found in layers dating back to the early Miocene epoch. That's about 23 million years ago. The youngest, if we can put it that way, fossils are found in sediments at the Pliocene-Pleistocene boundary, about 2.6 million years ago. As a result, we believe that megalodons lived between 23 and 2.6 million years ago. Thus, the zone of their habitat covered practically the whole globe, with exception of polar regions. The data on megalodon time and place of habitation were obtained quite easily. The really interesting part began with trying to determine the size, mass, speed of movement, and jaw strength of megalodon. These things are all necessary to understand megalodon's role in ancient food chains. The complexity of the issue lies in the fact that only megalodon teeth remain the main source of information. No one has ever seen a live megalodon, and even a whole skeleton was not found. There was only a partially preserved spine excavated in 1926 in Belgium and the remains of a spine discovered in Denmark in 1983. With such a scarcity of raw data, one can only wonder at the persistence and resourcefulness of researchers who managed to restore the appearance of Megalodon, its physical characteristics, diet, migration patterns, and other details of life. Let's see what we have today about Megalodon. Let's start with its physical data. The main tool for determination is extrapolation of relationships between tooth parameters and body size of its modern relatives. Data from great white sharks are most commonly used for this purpose. It is assumed that Megalodon had the same relationship between tooth size and skeletal characteristics, and its physiological parameters are calculated on this basis. According to the results of research published by Science Advances in 2022, we have the following portrait of Megalodon. The adult specimen length ranges from 16 to 22 meters, 52 to 72 feet. The Megalodon's head was the size of a small truck. That is more than 4.5 meters, 15 feet long. It had a back fin of 1.6 meters, 5 feet high, and a tail 4 meters, 13 feet high, like a Boeing 737. This means that a railroad car is needed to transport an adult megalodon. It would be difficult to load a huge shark in there, but the back fin and tail would have to be cut off. Otherwise, transportation would not be allowed due to height restriction. After learning about the size of Megalodon, someone is likely to ask, and why does it grow up to 22 meters, 72 feet? What is the secret of its size? Let us say straight away that there is no secret here. The size of Megalodon was formed in the same way as the size of the Gudgeon. 
Random gene mutations are caught by natural selection, the same way as everywhere else. The only difference is that megalodons undergo natural selection in the mother's womb. I know it sounds strange, but be patient. We'll tell more about it a bit later. So, we've covered the size of the megalodon. Now, it's time to move on to the weight. Megalodon weighed up to 50 tons. That's a great number for a living creature. Let's try to imagine what 50 tons is. For example, it is three tons more than the weight of two heavy self-propelled howitzers paladin together with shells and fuel. A Ford Explorer could drive into the fully opened mouth of an ancient predator. Thus, if the megalodon had clenched its jaws, it would have squeezed the roof up to the seats. Yes, the ancient predator had incredibly strong jaws. When it clenched its jaws, it could generate up to 20 tons of force. Its jaws could have been used as a crane, tie a cable to its lower jaw, and the megalodon could lift a full 10 cubic meter, 350 cubic feet water tank weighing over 10 tons. That's incredible! You've just learned about the strength of the megalodon's jaws. It's enormous. But to fully realize the power of this predator, we need to look at the armament of those jaws. The teeth. There's no doubt it must be a powerful and deadly weapon. A weapon that allows you to fill the stomach of 10 cubic meters, 353 cubic feet, in a matter of minutes. So, let's take a look at the arsenal of the ancient shark. The jaws of Megalodon had five rows of triangular jagged teeth, with a height of 16 to 20 centimeters, 6.3 to 7.8 inches. For comparison, the largest white shark tooth ever measured is 6 centimeters, 2.3 inches. Look at the difference between the two. Note, this is the largest white shark tooth ever measured. That's just incredible. In total, the megalodon has over 250 teeth spread over five rows. Combined with the tremendous strength of its jaws, they were a weapon that no one could resist in the ancient ocean. Description of the physical capabilities of Megalodon would be incomplete if we do not talk about its speed and endurance. Of course, many will object and say, how could we measure the speed of an ancient shark? There are no living Megalodons. They died out millions of years ago. How do we know how many meters they swam per second? Is that possible? Yes, it is. Not by direct measurement, but by extrapolation as in the case of size and weight. For example, there is data on the correlation between absolute cruising speed and body mass in 391 animals of the 28 existing shark species. Absolute cruising speed is the speed of a megalodon swimming calmly, without chasing prey. Based on such data, this value can be determined for megalodon. According to modern results obtained using 3D modeling, the average cruising speed of the giant shark was only 5 kilometers per hour, 3 miles per hour. You may say, that's not much. Yes, it's not much, but it's only a cruising speed, and it's seven times greater than that of a modern 18-meter, 59-foot whale shark. What's more, the megalodon was faster than any of the 391 sharks that were taken for extrapolation. When moving at cruising speed, Megalodon was very efficient. Calculations show that after eating something similar to a Miocene whale, it could move continuously at cruising speed for a month and a half. You may agree, that's impressive. One meal was enough for swimming across the Atlantic. High efficiency at cruising speed ensured a wide geography of megalodon migration. It could travel between continents without the risk of starvation. As a result, we find traces of it along the coasts of Asia, Africa, South America, and North America. The giant ancient predator mastered almost all the world's oceans and took the highest positions in the food chain everywhere. Was it alone out there? 
Did it have any enemies? Who competed with it in the struggle for prey? Now you will learn the answers to these questions. We have shown that the capabilities of the ancient super shark helped it to easily cope with very large prey, while its endurance made it easy for the shark to reach places where such prey was available. However, we know that there were other very large predators in the ancient oceans. For example, the Leviathan sperm whale, which also hunted whales. The teeth of this sperm whale reached 30 centimeters, 12 inches in length, and were a third larger than those of the Megalodon. Do you think that Megalodon was afraid of such a toothy competitor? Answering this question, we should remember that fear is an emotion, and it is unlikely that primitive ancient predators relied on emotions in their actions. They were driven by instinct. A predator's instinct tells it to retreat at the sight of a larger rival and commands it to attack a smaller rival. Modern sharks have no programmed fear of any predator, and there is no evidence that the ancients had any. In ancient times, as today, the outcome of an encounter between competing predators depends on circumstances. The most important of these is the size ratio. It is obvious that a young megalodon of 5 meters, 16 feet in size, would not attack a 10 meter, 33 foot Leviathan. It is likely to evade the fight. Similarly, a hungry adult megalodon would not miss a chance to eat a smaller, toothy sperm whale. The size ratio is decisive in the interaction of megalodon, not only with large Leviathan, but also with other smaller predators' competitors. Researchers refer to these, first of all, relatively small, 6 to 7 meters, 20 to 23 foot sperm whales, belonging to the now extinct genus of toothed whales. Researchers have at their disposal almost complete skeletons of sperm whales, Olophysiter, Brigmophysiter, Zygophysiter, Varoli. Their specific feature is elongated jaws with long, sharp teeth. The jaw shape is good for capturing and holding proportionate prey, but it is not suitable for attacking a much larger object. This means that these ancient sperm whales were only dangerous to young megalodon. Attacking an adult, they could damage the fins and tail, but no more. The same is true for prey. Megalodon's competitors could hunt the same animals as it, but again with a correction for size. For example, whereas a 10 meter long, 33 foot baleen whale is a tidbit for a megalodon, it is not a good prey for its competitors. They need something half that size. In general, the ratio of predator and prey size plays an important role. Thanks to it, there is a specific niche for adult megalodons, but for young, growing animals, the situation is different. For them, the most popular hunting target is the Cetotherum. This is a relatively small baleen whale, a warm-blooded filter feeder that eats krill. The maximum size of Cetotherum is 6 to 7 meters, 20 to 23 feet, which makes them a convenient prey not only for megalodon, but also for such predators as Olophysiter, Brigmophysiter, Zygophysiter, Varoli, Leviathan, Melvili. You are certainly wondering which of them is more effective, successful in the fight for prey. There is an answer to this question. Keep watching and you will learn about it. Megalodon had the best chance of success in the attack on Cetotherium. All baleen whales would lose to it because they breathed air. Megalodon, unlike them, could stay underwater for any period of time and would not give up the chase due to lack of oxygen. In addition, Megalodon's tactical arsenal was wider than that of its competitors. It could attack from above, from the side, but most importantly, the shape of its body made it possible to make a very powerful attack from below. In this case, the victim received a strong, spine-crushing blow. The megalodon then used its famous jaws 
and the fight was over very soon. Baleen whales, Megalodon's rivals, were incapable of such an attack because of the inappropriate jaw shape. Their narrow, elongated form was more suitable for grasping, holding, tearing off a fragment of the prey's body, but not for striking. Obviously, the described advantages helped Megalodon not only in attacks on Centotherium, but also in the fight with baleen whales and other predators. Against them, it always had a better chance of eating than being eaten. What do we see in the end? Can we be sure that the giant ancient shark was finished off by its competitors? The answer is no. The competitors couldn't fight off the Megalodon. Instead, they died out with it. With that said, the fact that other large ocean predators existed only tells us one thing. Megalodon did have its competitors. It's hard to say how dangerous they were, but judging by the millions of years of coexistence, the threat was not fatal. Moreover, Megalodon thrived, which indicates the existence of competitive advantages. It's not hard to guess that Megalodon's main advantages stem from its size. Megalodon was the largest and most powerful of the apex predators of the sea. Thanks to its size, the adult Megalodon preyed on what was beyond the power of its competitors. It easily coped with the largest prey of its time, and as a result, it gained two notable competitive advantages. The first advantage is obvious and easy to establish by simple logic. Indeed, we already know that in Megalodon's time, there were very large animals in the ancient oceans. Megalodon could tackle the largest of them, whereas other predators, though they hunted the same species, had to choose smaller specimens. This means that there was prey that only Megalodon hunted. As a result, it had food available to it, which is clearly an advantage in the struggle for life. The second advantage is not so obvious, and it was found only after analyzing the features of the Megalodon's body, as well as studying data on the caloric content of its diet. The results of such studies show that the adult Megalodon had no need for daily nutrition. After a successful hunt, it could easily do without food for a month. The secret of such a convenient diet lies in the stomach, with a volume of 10 cubic meters, 353 cubic feet, and high caloric content of whale fat, an essential part of its favorite food. A combination of these factors and fighting power spared Megalodon from the continuous search for food. It could choose its prey. It could cross the oceans in search of better food. As a result, we see that the adult Megalodon had no problems with food. It should be pointed out that it was the adult predator that had no problems. Young Megalodon had problems with nutrition and had to fight for food with other predators, but it also had its advantages. Barely born, the little Megalodon had already had the experience of deadly fights and went through a brutal school of survival. For it, the fight for life began in the womb. Yes, Megalodon and some of its distant descendants are characterized by interuterine cannibalism. This means that unborn predators eat their weaker siblings in the womb. Thus, natural selection starts before birth, and only the strongest large specimens enter the ocean. By the way, interuterine cannibalism is considered one of the reasons for the giant size of Megalodon. With this reproductive pattern, the offspring grow larger and have a better chance of surviving in the relentless environment of the ancient ocean. As a result, a competitive population of the top predators is formed. Today, we are sure competitors were not the cause of Megalodon's extinction. So why did they become extinct? No one knows the exact answer, but there are some interesting hypotheses. Keep watching 
and you'll find out why the giant ancient shark is no longer found in today's oceans. First of all, it should be said that, to date, no particular decisive reason for the disappearance of megalodons has been identified. During its existence, there were no devastating global disasters. The Earth did not collide with asteroids. There is no data on the eruption of supervolcanoes. There was nothing that would lead to a rapid mass death of the super predator. Megalodon became extinct gradually, and a number of factors contributed to its complete disappearance. Climate change and ocean level change are considered the most serious reasons. Both processes were not working in Megalodon's favor. The climate was getting colder, and the ocean level was dropping. The first process was detrimental to Megalodon because it is assumed that it, like the modern white shark, was a mesotherm. The body temperature of such creatures can increase through metabolism, but they have no control mechanism and cannot maintain a constant temperature. Therefore, when the outside temperature drops for long periods of time, mesotherms have a lower average body temperature, which results in slower metabolism and a marked decrease in growth rate. In the case of megalodons, the same thing happened. They grew slower, reached sexual maturity later, and, as a consequence, there were fewer of them. Falling ocean levels also affected the population. The fact is that young megalodon were born in warm, shallow areas scattered throughout the world's oceans. As a result of a gradual decline in ocean levels, the number of such original nurseries began to reduce, which inevitably led to a reduction in the number of adult specimens. Another of the possible reasons for the extinction of megalodons may be the gradual disappearance of the main meal in the megalodon's menu. Scientists have detected the gradual extinction of the Miocene baleen whales, occurring simultaneously with the megalodon's extinction. Thus, during the Pliocene epoch, the number of whale species decreased from 60 to 40, as their food also began to disappear. Science has established that the most important hunting object of the megalodons, baleen whale Cetotherium, became extinct about 5.3 to 2.5 million years ago. This is a period the end of which coincides with the period of megalodon's extinction. This fact makes the hypotheses of a connection between these processes as a strong relationship between the number of whales with apex predators convincing. A recent discovery by the Pimiento Research Group, led by Dr. Catalina Pimiento, supports such a hypothesis. The group discovered a previously unidentified extinction event among marine megafauna, mammals, seabirds, turtles, and sharks. The timing of this process coincides with the extinction of the megalodon. It didn't die out alone. Along with it, a third of other large marine creatures disappeared from the Earth. Species of large manatees and balaenidae disappeared. At least 43% of sea turtle species, 35% of seabirds, and 9% of sharks became extinct. This inevitably undermined the prey base of all age groups of megalodon, which in turn drastically reduced their overall numbers. Subsequently, combined with the other factors, this led to the complete extinction of megalodon. Thus, there were reasons for the extinction, but how it actually happened is unknown. We know one thing for sure, Megalodon emerged, reigned in the ancient ocean for several million years, and then gradually disappeared. That's what the fossil record says. The only thing we can touch, weigh, measure. Everything else is a hypothesis. Some of them are confirmed. Some of them are rejected by new research. This is the logic of scientific research, where there is always some room for mystery. Megalodon has many such mysteries. Researchers are trying to solve some of them, while other mysteries stir up the imagination.
from people far from science. The latter do not want to believe that the giant super predator disappeared irreversibly and assumed that there are still miraculously preserved megalodons somewhere in the ocean. As evidence, they cite publications in the media, amateur footage, even satellite images. A special role in the hype around Megalodon is taken by two movies, Megalodon, The New Evidence, and Shark of Darkness, Wrath of Submarine. Both movies are filmed as documentaries and have made a strong impression. Fans of the movies decided that the truth about Megalodons was deliberately concealed from them. The case took a serious turn and scientific community took up new facts about Megalodon. As a result, it was found that the sensational movies about Megalodon are pseudo-documentary, with computer graphics and actors. As for the rest of the various pieces of evidence published on the internet, it is the result of editing, fiction, and arbitrary interpretation of events in order to increase the popularity of the site. The position of the scientific community on this Megalodon's mystery has remained unchanged. There is no reliable information about Megalodons living today. Megalodons became extinct over two million years ago. Well, if they hadn't, what would we see now? Let's do a mental experiment and answer this question for ourselves. Suppose there was a population of ancient giant top predators left on Earth. To survive, they would first of all need something to eat and somewhere to reproduce safely. And all this would have to happen in accordance with their instincts and in certain climactic conditions. Let's start with the daily bread and see if the modern world ocean is able to feed at least a small number of adult megalodons. As you already know, the main object of their hunting were whales. Today, the largest animal on the planet, the whale, is also suitable for this role. The number of whales of all species is about 1,300,000. This is quite enough to provide food for a certain number of ancient super sharks with the traditional regulation of the number according to predator-prey pattern. In modern conditions, however, this pattern would have been a big surprise to the megalodon. It would turn out to be not only a predator, but also a prey. An adult megalodon could have been attacked by killer whales. Imagine what a spectacular scene it would have been. Three 10-meter, 33-foot killer whales attacking a 20-meter, 66-foot long megalodon. Inferior in size, killer whales have a decisive advantage, the ability to hunt in a group. By skillfully distracting and attacking, a trio of killer whales would inflict ever-increasing damage to the giant. As a result, even a very strong single predator has almost no chance to survive in such a battle. But we have to give proper respect to Megalodon. Any killer whale that lost its watchfulness and broke away from the pack would have been easy prey for the Megalodon. That's life in the ocean. Now let's answer the question, what could people have observed? Would we have discovered Megalodon? Of course we would. Megalodons should be right next to whales. People have been hunting whales for a long time. Biologists have been watching them. But Megalodons have never been seen around whales. Though we would have certainly seen the grand scenes of the giants chasing and fighting. Also, People have been studying killer whales for a long time, and scenes of megalodons being attacked would certainly have been recorded. There is a clear contradiction here between how things must have been if megalodon were alive and what we see in reality. There's something else that would be missing if megalodon were alive. It would be around whales, but whales get hit by ships quite often. The average death rate for blue whales alone from ship strikes is 1.2 per year. Collisions without fatalities are much more common. Among the most well-studied group of whales in the Gulf of St. Lawrence 
about 9% have scars, obviously from collisions with ships. That is, we see that the most likely prey regularly collide with vessels. But there are no recorded collisions between vessels and the hunter. This is another contradiction between assumption and reality. We have found that under current conditions, the interaction of an adult megalodon with prey and competing predators would have definitely led to the observed consequences. Let's now talk about the reproductive process. As mentioned earlier, young megalodon are born in a kind of nursery. These should be large, warm, and relatively shallow areas. Such areas are usually located in subtropical and tropical zones near inhabited coasts. If megalodon existed today, sailors and dwellers of such coasts would enjoy an amazing show. Just imagine a huge pregnant female megalodon, which is 18 meters, 59 feet long, and 50 tons of weight, entering the coastal waters to give birth to three-meter-long megalodon babies. Such an event would certainly have had eyewitnesses. It would certainly have come to the attention of biologists and other scientists. Eventually, it is safe to say we don't observe anything of what should be if megalodon were alive. Talking about megalodon living today, it is necessary to answer one more acute question. If megalodon was not extinct, would it hunt on a human? Let's say right away that we wouldn't be of any interest as a prey for an adult specimen. The difference in weight categories is too great. Adult top predators hunt for prey of adequate size, and we would not see them on the beaches more often than whales. The young megalodon is a very different matter. In ancient times, it fed on fish. But there were no humans back then. Today, a 5-meter-long, 16-feet baby megalodon might well attack a human. That would happen sooner or later if the ancient super-predator were resurrected. Can it be resurrected? Currently, it can't. It would require a well-preserved DNA sample. But there are no such samples in the fossil remains at our disposal. Wait a minute. The attentive viewer might say, we don't have DNA today, but perhaps a suitable sample will appear tomorrow. What about resurrection in that case? Theoretically, megalodon revival is possible with DNA. However, we should not rush to positive conclusions. Thanks to modern technology, experts are now able to extract and analyze DNA from the bones and teeth of long dead living creatures. However, the existing methods have limitations. It is believed that over 2 to 2.6 million years, ancient DNA becomes so fragmented that it's impossible to restore its integrity. Reconstructing megalodon requires whole, intact DNA. But we know that megalodon died out about 2.5 million years ago. Accordingly, there is virtually no chance of finding intact megalodon DNA. If a miracle happens and we are lucky enough to have the complete DNA of Megalodon at our disposal, it does not mean that it will be instantly recovered. There are many practical and ethical problems on this path. The difference between a single specimen and an entire species should be kept in mind. A single Megalodon bred for scientific purposes is acceptable, but recreating an entire species is not. Interfering with the Earth's ecosystem on such a scale would cause irreversible consequences. Nowadays, we are convinced that everything in nature is interconnected. The emergence or extinction of an entire species can initiate dangerous processes leading to disruption of the existing balance. We know that Megalodon was a link and product of the ancient ocean ecosystem. What would be the consequences if it were introduced into the food chains of the modern ocean? Would the ecosystem return to the balance? Recreating Megalodon raises many questions, but frankly speaking, they are more theoretical than practical, because we do not have an answer to the most important question. 
Why should we resurrect an ancient monster? Now, let's go back in time to the era of other monsters, dinosaurs, and meet the largest ones among them. We know that the largest living animal is the blue whale, weighing about 136 metric tons and growing to over 30 meters, 98 feet long. It's also the largest animal that has ever lived. But blue whales live in the ocean, where conditions differ from those on land. Then what about the largest land animal? Today, elephants hold this prestigious title. But if we travel back in history, we encounter even more colossal giants, the dinosaurs. Hop into our time machine, and off we go. In general, dinosaurs varied greatly in weight and size. They could weigh from a few grams to tens and even hundreds of metric tons. Moreover, it's worth noting that their sizes changed depending on the time period. Dinosaurs lived on Earth during the Triassic, Early Jurassic, Late Jurassic, and Cretaceous periods, collectively comprising the Mesozoic Era. It is believed that they reached their largest sizes during the Cretaceous period. Theropod dinosaurs were the most common predators of the Mesozoic. An interesting parallel emerges when comparing the weight of dinosaurs versus modern carnivorous mammals. The latter usually weigh between 10 and 100 kilograms, 22 to 220 pounds, while the former from 100 to 1,000 kilograms 220 to 2200 pounds. Interestingly, the largest dinosaurs weren't predators at all. You are about to see this for yourself. But let's clear something up first. Scientists will probably never be able to say with 100% certainty which dinosaur species was the largest. This is because very few dinosaur remains have fossilized. Most of these remains will either never be discovered or have already been accidentally destroyed. It's exceptionally rare to find relatively complete skeletons. Even less often, scientists discover prints of skin and other soft tissue. Reconstructing the muscles and organs of many dinosaur species, as well as estimating their appearance and weight, presents a major challenge, even today. But it's not completely impossible. Today, researchers use the laser scanning method to overlay virtual skin onto known or presumed skeletons. In this way, modern technology allows us to at least approximately identify the most gigantic dinosaurs. Now, let's move on to the first highlight of our journey. Here, you'll see dinosaurs ranked fifth among the largest of their kind. Their sheer size may take your breath away. Imagine a bone weighing three metric tons. That's how much a block containing one of four vertebrae weighed when it was excavated from a farm in Oklahoma in 1994. Researchers needed a tractor to transport it. Initially, these fossils were deemed too massive for any animal and were mistaken for petrified tree trunks. As you will see, there have been a few similar misidentification cases in dinosaur research history. What kind of animal could such huge vertebrae belong to? Their owner was Sauroposeidon, a genus of sauropods, large four-legged dinosaurs that lived during the Jurassic and Cretaceous periods and are known from a few incomplete fossilized skeletons. The name Sauroposeidon comes from the Greek words Soros, meaning lizard, and Poseidon, the god of the sea in ancient Greek mythology, who also controlled earthquakes. The name hints that the weight of sauropods was so great that they literally shook the earth as they walked. But let's get back to those bones. The vertebrae were kept until 1999, when they were handed over to American paleontologist Matt Waddell for analysis. In 2000, the researcher officially published his findings. As a result, some sources mistakenly called Sauroposeidon 
the largest dinosaur in the history of dinosaur studies. Consider this. Its head and elongated neck could reach 16.5 to 18 meters, 54 to 59 feet, which is equivalent to a six-story building, making it one of the tallest known dinosaurs, perhaps even the tallest. However, there is no evidence suggesting that Sauroposeidon held its neck strictly vertically. This would have put a considerable load on its heart. According to one theory, it held its neck and head horizontally parallel to the ground. All right, but what about overall body length? The dinosaurs were 27 to 34 meters, 89 to 112 feet long, with shoulder length of 6 to 7 meters, 20 to 23 feet, and weighed 40 to 60 metric tons. However, sauropods likely had a system of air sacs, similar to those in modern birds, serving several important functions, regulating body temperature, filling their lungs with air, and changing body density during swimming and diving. They also reduced body weight due to bone cavities, which means that sauropods might have been 20% lighter than assumed. In 2012, numerous other sauropod remains, previously identified under different names for decades, were reclassified under the genus Sauroposeidon. These encompassed sauropod bones and tracts, including partial skeletons that have long been found in the Poloxi River region of Texas. Interestingly, in the mid-1980s, students at the University of Texas at Austin discovered a bone bed on a ranch in Hood County. However, excavation stopped in 1987 and only resumed in 1993. All sauropod remains from this site appear to belong to the same genus. Some parts of a skull were discovered in the quarry, including the left upper jaw and teeth. Also, a part of the neck with seven vertebrae, 13 backbone vertebrae, and 30 tail vertebrae, as well as samples of all limb and girdle bones, except for some front and hind leg bones. Considering their long necks, you may have imagined sauropods as somewhat odd creatures for their time, akin to modern-day giraffes. But that's not the case. They were a very large group that first appeared in the early Jurassic period and soon spread all over the world. Sauroposeidons inhabited areas of tropical and subtropical forests, near river deltas, coastal swamps, bays, and lagoons. Few creatures in the animal kingdom dared to attack adult Sauroposeidons, but the young were probably hunted by groups of predatory dinosaurs from the Carnosaur clan. Sauroposeidons were herbivores. Their long necks most likely allowed them to eat leaves from the tops of magnolias, palms, and sycamores. But some theories suggest that due to the inability to hold their necks vertically, Sauroposeidons might have fed on vegetation that was growing on lower levels. How much food do you think this little one might need per day to stay healthy? As a matter of fact, a whole ton. Yep, it was a real leaf processing factory. However, one Clash of the Dinosaurs episode on the Discovery Channel mentioned that young Sauroposeidons attained their massive size by eating insects and small mammals. But this boldly contradicts the widely accepted theory. Today, there is absolutely no evidence to suggest that sauropods were even partially carnivorous. It's only speculated that prosauropods, their distant Triassic ancestors, might have been omnivorous. Scientists don't know exactly how sauroposeidons moved, but by comparing them with other large, short-legged sauropods, they concluded that they were amongst the slowest dinosaurs. As you can see, we don't know much about this species, and most of the information was extrapolated from comparing them with more well-known auropods. Now, let's briefly go back to modern times. Imagine two London buses standing one behind the other. That's how long our next character was. And here it is, the Dreadnoughtus, 
a genus of titanosaurian sauropod containing a single species, Dreadnoughtus shrani. Shrani is in honor of American entrepreneur Adam Schran for his financial support of the study. The name Dreadnought means fearing nothing or fearless. It was chosen by Drexel University paleontologist Kenneth Lacavara, who discovered the species. The animal's virtual invulnerability, due to its size, reminded scientists of early 20th century large steel battleships. The dinosaur is known from two partial skeletons discovered in the Patagonian cliffs of Argentina, in the Upper Cretaceous rocks, which are about 70 to 76 million years old. These are the most complete skeletons compared to other giant titanosaurs. Scientists have about 70% of the bones needed to fully describe the creature. From these remains, it is reliably known that the dreadnought was one of the largest terrestrial vertebrates. Based on the skeletons, the total length of its body was about 26 meters, 85 feet, and it weighed 48 to 49 metric tons. And if you look at the body parts, the tail reached 9 meters, 30 feet, and the elongated neck, 11 meters, 36 feet. That is, the neck was almost half the length of the animal. Wait, but then Sara Poseidon is larger, you might say. But here is an important clarification. The specimen had the features of a juvenile individual. That is, the dreadnought was supposed to grow even larger, and no one knows how big it could become. Hang on, but how did scientists know that the dreadnought remains they found were teenagers? All young vertebrates have so-called growth zones in their bones, cartilaginous epiphyseal plates. In adults, they are overgrown with normal bone tissue. However, this doesn't apply to reptiles because they grow throughout life, albeit it's much more pronounced in their youth. Also, the bone cells or osteones have a rather round shape in young dinosaurs, while they are more elongated in the mature ones. So the paleontologists found unfused bones in the shoulders of the dreadnoughts they discovered. And they also had many round osteones. This suggested that the dinosaurs were actively growing at the time of death. Due to the large size of bones and the remoteness of the discovery site, it took four years to completely excavate them. In 2009, the fossils were transported to Philadelphia on an ocean freighter for study. They were studied at Drexel University and the Carnegie Museum of Natural History. And in 2015, the remains were returned to Argentina, where they are permanently stored in the Padre Molina Museum in Rio Gallegos. The bones of both dreadnought specimens were scanned using a 3D laser scanner. This helped field paleontologist Locavera study the fossils in the safest way possible without damaging their structure. The animal's weight was determined based on the circumference of the humerus and femur. Using this formula, it would have weighed 59.3 metric tons. That means the dreadnought would have been more than eight and a half times heavier than a male African elephant and several tons heavier than a Boeing 737-900 airliner. However, this weight estimate was criticized for being exaggerated. Matt Waddell, already known to us from the study of Sauroposeidon, calculated the weight of this dinosaur to be between 36 and 40 metric tons. Another researcher, Gregory Paul, using methods based on more accurate skeletal restoration, suggested that the dinosaur weighed only 26 metric tons. But all these estimates were ultimately considered inaccurate. A few years ago, in 2020, two studies estimated that the dreadnought's mass at 48 to 49 metric tons. As you can see, the question of the dreadnought's size is highly debatable. When we look at one species, and it appears to weigh 20 times more than another species, Maybe what we're really looking at is an individual that is simply 30 years older than the other animal, said Dr. Lacavara. In terms of proportions, Dreadnought's forelimbs were longer than those of any other previously known titanosaur, although they were still not much longer than the hind limbs, and the neck was presumably held horizontally. 
Scientists believe that their diet was no different from that of other sauropods. They consumed a large amount of plants, using their long necks to reach food. Why did they die? Most theories suggest that they were quickly and deeply buried, hence the good preservation of the skeletons. Apparently, there was a catastrophic flood. The waters broke through a natural dam, turning the ground into a muddy mess, and the two dinosaurs were buried in an eroded crevice. What else made the discovery of the Dreadnoughtus particularly special? Well, it helped to calculate the bone strengths of dinosaurs and the maximum mass they could withstand. From there, it's a short step to modeling this sauropod's breathing, blood pressure, and dietary needs. Now, let's move on to our next hero, a true titan, who was discovered completely by accident, and again in Argentina. A shepherd from a ranch in southern Argentina stumbled upon giant bones while herding sheep. The ranch owner, Oscar Mayo, reached out to paleontologists, and scientists began excavations. During excavations in 2012, 2013, and 2015, they uncovered hundreds of bones from at least six long-necked and long-tailed dinosaurs. To be precise, 200 fossils were discovered including 130 sauropod bones and 57 teeth of theropod carnivorous dinosaurs. Among the finds were bones that belonged to a previously unknown species. This time, the world learned about the Paddocotitans, or more precisely, Paddocotitan Maiorum, meaning Patagodian Titan of the Mayo family. The dinosaur earned this name because its bones were excavated at the La Flecha Ranch owned by the Mayo family, and titanium refers to the dinosaur's strength and large size. Patagotitan started making headlines back in 2014, even before its bones were fully unearthed. The discovered parts of its neck, back, tail, and limbs were enough to understand. The world had never seen such a dinosaur before. British broadcaster and naturalist David Attenborough referred to it in his documentary. In 2016, the American Museum of Natural History dedicated an exhibition to it. According to Smithsonian Magazine, the giant was over 37 meters, 127 feet long, and weighed more than 70 metric tons, meaning it was longer than a blue whale and weighed more than a dozen African elephants. Its femur alone was 2.4 meters, 7.9 feet long. Later studies claimed that Patagotitan was up to 31 meters, 102 feet long, and weighed about 50 to 57 metric tons. The dinosaur was most likely an herbivore and lived in a wooded area dominated by coniferous species. For some time, no official description of the dinosaur's bones was released so that other experts could verify whether it was really the largest land animal ever, as the newspapers claimed. But in 2017, paleontologist Jose Carballido from the Paleontological Museum Egidio Ferruglio and his colleagues finally published details about this giant. But Matt Waddell, who has been working on some major dinosaur projects and has been following the Titanosaur Patagotitan since 2014, was not impressed by the study. According to his estimates, this dinosaur cannot be considered the largest. Moreover, he believed that the main part of the article didn't include some important bone measurements. Be that as it may, Patagotitan joined the club of giant dinosaurs. The reconstructed skeleton was exhibited at the American Museum of Natural History in New York. But this is not the only place where you can witness this giant. Skeletons recreated based on the found bones of Patagotitan are displayed in many museums. The oldest remains were 101 million years old. The animals most likely died in three different floods. But this is just one theory. There is another. The fact is that the dinosaur remains were found in one place, but in different paleontological layers. Therefore, the researchers assumed that there was a lake where animals came to drink. 
Perhaps it dried up during a drought, and the dinosaurs died of thirst at different times. What can you tell from four vertebrae? As it turns out, it's enough to recreate an entire dinosaur if these are well-preserved neck, back, and tail vertebrae, even though they constitute just 3% of the skeleton. Based on them, scientists learned a lot about another massive sauropod, Puertosaurus, a member of the Titanosaurs. The dinosaur was named Puertosaurus Reuli in honor of the two researchers who discovered the remains and worked on them, Pablo Puerta and Santiago Reul. The previously mentioned scanty remains were also found in Argentina in the Santa Cruz province in southern Patagonia in 2001. It was determined that they date back to the late Cretaceous period, between 70 and 76 million years ago. Like all sauropods, Huertosaurus was an herbivore. Petrified tree trunks were found not far from the vertebrae, which suggests that this dinosaur lived in the forest. While scientists today have great capabilities, they are not limitless. So it's impossible to determine the exact size of the animal from just four vertebrae. Nonetheless, it was suggested that it was 30 meters, 98 feet long, and weighed 50 metric tons. There were many other assumptions. The dinosaur was given a maximum length of 35 to 40 meters, 115 to 131 feet, and a weight ranging from 80 to 100 metric tons. The overall size can be extrapolated from the largest discovered vertebrae, the dorsal one, which is the only one that remains intact. It is 1.1 meters, 3.6 feet high, and 1.7 meters, 5.6 feet wide, making it the widest known sauropod vertebrae. By the way, Puertosaurus became the first giant titanosaur found with a cervical vertebrae, and it was a particularly large one. Its transverse width is 140 centimeters, 55 inches, and it's believed to be the ninth vertebrae. In 2013, Mike Taylor and Matt Waddell estimated the length of Puertosaurus's neck to be about 9 meters, 30 feet. Scientists believe it was long, thick, and flexible. Presumably, it had wide cervical ribs and thick, short nerve processes. Finally, the two caudal vertebrae from the middle of the tail are of a standard shape for titanosaurs, with a concave anterior part and a convex posterior part. However, little is known about them yet, as they have not been described in detail. Thus, our hero had a solid build, a massive torso, and seemingly large lungs that pumped significant volumes of oxygen. Also, to carry a body weighing tens, if not 100 tons, Puertosaurus must have had powerful muscular legs. The vertebrae's size and shape suggest that it had the widest rib cage among all titanosaurs. It was approximately 5.8 meters, 16.4 to 26.2 feet wide. To put this into perspective, many modern American school corridors are 4.9 meters, 16 feet wide, and the classroom size is 9 by 9 meters, 30 by 30 feet. Imagine this giant, whose chest was the size of an entire classroom, moving at an estimated speed of 12.2 kilometers per hour, 7.6 miles per hour. That's one and a half times as fast as a human can walk, but about half the top speed of a modern Komodo dragon. It was most likely one of the slowest dinosaurs. According to scientists, Huertosauruses were relatively peaceful herbivores. They ate all types of vegetation. Thanks to their flexible necks, these dinosaurs could reach high branches behind their heads instead of having to turn their entire body. They likely could also stand on their hind legs to reach the very tops of trees that were unreachable to other animals. Therefore, in all fairness, there was no need for Puertosaurus to run fast. Their best defenses against predators were size and strength. In extreme cases, they could make use of their long neck, tail, and massive legs which could certainly shake the ground. Moreover, Puertosaurus probably moved in herds, which provided even better protection. That is, 
Fighting them would be like fighting an entire mountain range. These herds most likely stayed in one place for a long time, eating everything within reach. At that time, the climate was rainy and humid, so Puertasars most likely lived in dense forests. This provided them with an almost endless food supply, enough for both them and the Dreadnoughtus giants who lived alongside them. But Puertasaurus eggs, as well as their young, old, sick, or injured individuals could be in danger. Theropod Orcoraptor, which reached 9 meters, 30 feet in length, and weighed up to 1.5 tons, posed a particular threat. Their teeth were perfect for tearing flesh. Pertosaurus evolved during the late Cretaceous and, along with similar titanosaurs, marked the culmination of this line of evolution. It went extinct 55 million years ago during the late Cretaceous mass extinction event that ended the era of dinosaurs. And now we are approaching the last point of our journey, the habitat of dinosaurs, which many paleontologists consider the largest in history. They are also possibly the longest animals of all time, although we don't yet have indisputable evidence to support any of these claims. How was it discovered? Things just happen by accident, as they always do. In 1987, a farm owned near the town of Plaza Huincal in Argentina found what is presumed to be a dinosaur's fibula on his property. The man decided that he had discovered a piece of petrified wood and reported it to the local museum. Museum employees dug it up and exhibited the fibula in one of their halls. Two years later, Argentine paleontologist Jose Bonaparte organized more extensive excavations at the site resulting in the discovery of additional bones from the same dinosaur. Eventually, scientists unearthed seven dorsal vertebrae, the lower part of the sacrum, some sacral ribs and part of a dorsal rib. These finds were exhibited in the same museum. Bonaparte presented them at a scientific conference in San Juan in 1989. The detailed description authored by Bonaparte and Argentine paleontologist Rodolfo Correa was published four years later in 1993. It was then that the herbivorous dinosaur received its name, Argentinosaurus huancalensis. The first part meant Argentinian lizard, and the second referred to the city of Plaza Huincal, which is close to the discovery site. Despite being known only from fragmentary remains, many scientists consider the Argentinosaurus to be the largest dinosaur and possibly the longest animal ever. It was 30 to 35 meters, 98 to 115 feet long, and weighed 65 to 80 metric tons, according to some estimates, and 80 to 100 metric tons, according to others. However, data from 2013 suggests it was 39.7 meters, 130 feet long and 7.3 meters, 24 feet high at the shoulders. Yet again, due to the incompleteness of the remains, its exact size is difficult to estimate. Like other titanosaurs, Argentinosaurus likely had 10 dorsal vertebrae, and they were huge. One of the dorsal ones was estimated to be 159 centimeters high, 63 inches, and 129 centimeters, 51 inches wide. Argentinosaurus reached full size in about 15 to 40 years. Their distinguishing features, as with other sauropods, were a small head, a long narrow tail, and an extremely long thick neck. However, it's unclear how Argentinosaurus held its neck. It likely resembled how a giraffe moves its neck, that is, they could hold their necks in a way that allowed them to eat from tall trees, bend down to drink water and maneuver to eat leaves between large branches. These giants also had thick trunk-like legs with rounded feet that helped distribute weight. Scientists came up with an ingenious way to calculate the size of Argentinosaurus. They compare available fragments of those of smaller related sauropods known from more complete remains. Scientists take into account the proportions between different parts of the skeleton. This ratio is then extrapolated on the available Argentinosaurus fragments. 
This provides a general idea of the dinosaur's size, but can't be considered an accurate reconstruction. The weight is determined based on the known ratio between specific bones and body weight. Paleontologists were able to estimate not only the overall size of Argentinosaurus, but also the parameters of its separate body parts. Thus, according to their estimate from 1994, the length of the hind limbs was 4.5 meters, 15 feet. The length of the body from hip to shoulder was 7 meters, 23 feet. And the total body length was 30 meters, 98 feet. One hypothesis suggests that Argentinosaurus had a shorter tail and a narrower chest than Puertosaurus. But then it would have been smaller itself. However, subsequent research has disproven this. Another theory argues that some diplodocids, such as Supersaurus and Diplodotus, may have been longer than Argentinosaurus, although they were significantly less massive. And we already know the advantage of large size. Few predators dared to challenge this giant. Yet even Argentinosaurus was hunted, and by none other than Mapusaurus, one of the largest known theropods reaching five tons. How could they take down such a giant? They are known from at least seven individuals found together. So Mapusaurus likely hunted in packs. Actually, in this case, the large size was the only advantage Argentinosaurus had, because it couldn't run away from them. Like our previous characters, it was very slow. A computer model of the skeleton and muscles showed that Argentinosaurus at a top speed of 7 kilometers per hour, 5 miles per hour. Before computer modeling, a dinosaur's speed could only be estimated by studying its tracks and anatomy. Scientists determined their muscle properties by comparing them to those of living animals. As a result, the digital Argentinosaurus learned to walk. Most likely, the animal had a gait in which the front and hind legs on one side of the body moved simultaneously. As we have already mentioned, Argentinosauruses were herbivores and ate leaves from trees and shrubs. To maintain their considerable mass, they had to eat 553 to 576 kilograms, 1220 to 1269 pounds of vegetation per day. We're sure you would agree that this is quite a whopper. Thus, in a short time, several Argentinosauruses could devour an entire forest of trees. This caused significant damage to the local flora. But, of course, one can't even compare it to the damage from the catastrophe that wiped out not only the flora, but also the Argentinosauruses themselves. And indeed, all dinosaurs. It is known that they died out as a result of the Cretaceous Paleogene extinction event at the end of the Cretaceous period. It occurred about 66 million years ago. Scientists are still arguing about what caused it, but the main theory involves a giant asteroid landing near Mexico. This led to a sharp rise in temperature, killing many animals. It also caused massive destruction, shock waves, forest fires, tsunamis, volcanic eruptions, deadly acid rain, and earthquakes. And then came a years-long winter that cooled down the planet. Ironically, those who had dominated the Earth and evolved here for about 174 million years couldn't survive it. Some say that dinosaurs began to die out about 70 million years ago. However, they might have been able to bounce back. But the asteroid had other plans. But the history of evolution continues, and we'll soon learn about other giant creatures. Our encounter with Gigantopithecus began with a small detail, teeth. And they were found not in excavations, but in an unexpected place. It all happened in 1935, in a pharmacy in Hong Kong, on a day that was very remarkable for science. There, the German paleontologist Gustav von Koenigswald 
bought teeth that were twice as big as gorillas' teeth. At this point, we shall explain what we meant. The Chinese merchants sold teeth, known as dragon teeth. You probably imagine the familiar fairy tale fire-breathing creature, but things were a little different in China. Early on in China, the dragon was associated with symbols of imperial power. It was also seen as a water deity. So how did dragon teeth appear in the pharmacy? Chinese medicine has a long and successful history of using fossilized animal bones and teeth for therapeutic purposes, and they were traditionally considered dragon teeth. High demand for them triggered numerous excavations which were carried out by merchants. And eventually, these so-called dragon bones and teeth attracted the interest of Western paleontological scientists. In the 20th century, they began to search for the sources of these fossilized remains. Von Kenningswald was one of those scientists. He conducted research on homonyms, a subfamily of the hominin family, including Homo erectus. His discoveries and studies of hominid fossils in Java, as well as studies of other important fossils from Southeast Asia, firmly established his reputation as one of the leading figures of 20th century paleoanthropology. That's why he realized that the teeth from the pharmacy belonged to an ape, even though they were not similar in size to those of the species known at the time. Also, despite their size, the dragon teeth resembled human teeth in some respects. Therefore, paleoanthropologists even had a theory about giant human ancestors. Von Koenigswald named the animal with giant teeth Gigantopithecus. Since then, many giant teeth and four mandibular bones have been found in Asia. The 1950s were particularly fruitful. In 1955, the Chinese Institute of Vertebrate Paleontology and Paleoanthropology commissioned a research team led by Chinese paleontologist Pei Wenzong to find the original location of Gigantopithecus. They collected 47 teeth among so-called dragon bones in Guangdong and Guangxi provinces in southern and southeastern China. In 1956, the team found the first remains in a cave in Nishui Mountain, Guangxi. Also in 1956, the first mandible and more than 1,000 teeth were found in Liusheng followed by many more remains found in at least 16 sites. Judging by them, the scientists concluded that Gigantopithecus was the largest known ape. Just imagine, according to research, this big fellow grew to about 3 meters, 10 feet in height, and weighed up to 500 kilograms, 1,100 pounds. It could easily bring down a 2 meter, 6.5 feet tall gorilla so it was virtually invincible. Of course, the stated size of Gigantopithecus is approximate and is calculated based on the size of its teeth and jaws. The idea of a giant ape has been so exciting that people have not stopped hypothesizing about its appearance, habits, and other features. Since the discovery of Gigantopithecus by Gustav von Koenigswald, Except for the teeth and jaw, no other parts of the skeleton have been found, which would allow us to at least roughly suggest what it looked like. However, scientists have identified three species of Gigantopithecus. The best known is Gigantopithecus blackie. It is also the largest. It lived from 2 million to 100,000 years ago. The name of the second species, Gigantopithecus giganteus, can be misleading because it was actually half the size of Gigantopithecus blackie. The species is known from India, though, and the size difference may be attributed to adaptation to a different climate, although there are indications that it also inhabited some parts of China. Finally, the third species, also from India, is Gigantopithecus belasparensis, and it stands out from the previous two as its remains date back to the late Miocene period, that is, from 9 to 6 million years ago. Thus, the existence of Gigantopithecus is extended by many millions of years, between the Miocene, 
through the Pliocene to the Pleistocene epoch, which began 2.58 million years ago. Gigantopithecus reconstructions are very approximate. Some researchers blame porcupines and their relatives. They lived near Gigantopithecus and may have eaten most of their bones. Yes, surprisingly, being generally vegetarians, porcupines gladly gnaw on the bones of other animals when they are forced to do so by living conditions. In general, our protagonist is often portrayed as a gorilla-like ape, since gorillas are the largest apes known today. But in fact, the structure of the lower jaw of Gigantopithecus is more similar to the same part of the orangutan. This is why Gigantopithecus are classified in the subfamily Pongine, along with orangutans. For the same reason, reconstructions that give giant apes similar features to orangutans are considered more accurate. For example, Gigantopithecus may have had red hair. Unlike the hair of gorillas, it grew several inches or even feet long, so it might be more similar to the hair of orangutans. In addition, males would have cheek flanges and developed gular sacs, which attracted females. The reproduction probably occurred once every five to ten years, and females raised their cubs for several years before their paths diverged. In many reconstructions, we often see a specimen in an upright position to make it easier to envision the full size of this ape. For example, when you see a bear on all four legs, it appears quite large, but when it stands on two legs, it gives the impression of a much bigger animal. It's the same with Gigantopithecus. Most scientists believe that it walked on four legs because of its mass, although it may occasionally perform upright walking too. But it only moved short distances that way. Assuming that the skeleton of Gigantopithecus resembled other anthropoid apes, it simply did not have the skeletal musculature that would have allowed it to stand on two legs without additional effort. However, there is one theory put forward by anthropologist Grover Krantz, according to which Gigantopithecus were bipedal. Why did he think so? Keep watching and you'll find out the answer to that question. The thing is that the jaws found were U-shaped and broadened toward the back. This allowed the skull to sit upright on a straight spine, as with humans, rather than in front of it, as with anthropoid apes. But Krantz's assumptions may have been distorted by his desire to link Gigantopithecus to the abominable snowman from North America. Moreover, most animals have a jaw that expands similarly regardless of how the head is positioned relative to the neck. That's why many scientists consider Krantz's theory to be wrong. And since we've started talking about the skull, we should mention the brain. Alas, as we already said, even the remains of the skull of Gigantopithecus have not yet been found by scientists. But by the size of the jaws, we can conclude that the brains of these giant apes were significantly larger than those of gorillas. In 2011, paleontologists from China studied the enamel of giant apes and concluded that they ate exclusively C3 plants, those that grow in cool, moist forests. At the same time, the remains of other mammals that lived together with Gigantopithecus, rhinoceroses, tapirs, hyenas, suggest that they fed on both C3 plants and C4 plants. The latter grows in drier, grassier areas. This may indicate that Gigantopithecus lived in a mosaic habitat, a mixture of forests and grasslands. But unlike other herbivores, they preferred to stay in the thick forest and did not wander into open areas, just like modern orangutans and mountain gorillas. We have repeatedly mentioned the similarities between Gigantopithecus and the orangutan, and this connection, as it turns out, has even deeper roots. Having many teeth and several fragments of jaws of the giant ape, scientists have tried to fit it into the genealogical tree of the apes, but that usually requires usable DNA. The DNA played a key role in helping scientists map the tangled connection between hominids and other primates that lived during the last 50,000 years. 
But it's very difficult to extract DNA in those old fossils. Scientists have managed to do this in only a few rare cases, including one where the age of the hominid was 400,000 years. By the way, DNA decays much faster in hot, humid climates. Now, consider the difficulty of the task. The age of the Gigantopithecus remains ranges from about 100,000 to 300,000 to 2 million years, and its DNA has never been extracted. Therefore, in the new study, an international team of scientists used the methods of a new field called proteomics, a field of molecular biology dedicated to the analysis of proteins. This is how the researchers obtained molecular information from the molars of Gigantopithecus. By what? In proteomics, researchers reverse engineer DNA to some extent, studying proteins in teeth that survive much longer than DNA. Each protein is made up of amino acids, and each amino acid is encoded by a three-letter DNA sequence, so researchers can create fragments of ancient DNA from them. In September 2018, this method was used to determine the correct place of a 1.7 million year old woolly rhinoceros in a genealogical tree. This proved that it can be used to better understand ancient animals. So the same technique was used to mine a protein from a 1.9 million year old Gigantopithecus molar tooth found in Chuefeng Cave in China. The team dissolved a small amount of enamel from the tooth and then analyzed it. As a result, the scientists were able to identify 500 peptides, or short chains of amino acids, from six different proteins. Five of these proteins are still found in modern species of monkeys. After comparative analysis, it turned out that Gigantopithecus is a distant relative of present-day orangutans. The two lines probably diverged from a common ancestor 10 million years ago. Until now, people gained all the knowledge about the species from the teeth and jaws found, which were typical for herbivores. Now, they have been supplemented by the analysis of ancient proteins, allowing us to reconstruct the evolutionary history of Gigantopithecus. Potentially, proteomics can be used to examine not only molars, but also to analyze protein sequences in the bones of monkeys that have lost viable DNA long ago. The successful implementation of this method is extremely important for the future of paleoanthropology, since many fossilized remains of ancient hominids are found in tropical and subtropical regions such as East and South Africa and Indonesia. The probability of finding viable DNA is very low. But the trick with protein changes everything. Until now, it was only possible to get genetic information from fossils up to 10,000 years old if they were from warm and humid regions. The new technique is also interesting considering the fact that the ancient remains of the ancestors of our species, Homo sapiens, are mostly found in subtropical areas as well. So we can potentially get similar information about the evolutionary lineage leading to humans. By the way, speaking of humans, according to a new study by Canadian scientist Jack Rink, Gigantopithecus lived near us for over one million years. Fortunately for humans, ancient apes ate bamboo. The missing piece of the puzzle was always to determine when Gigantopithecus lived. And now it turns out that they coexisted with humans when the latter were undergoing major evolutionary changes. Guangxi province in South China, where some Gigantopithecus fossils were found, is the same region where, according to alternative theories, the human species originated. And humans may have contributed to the extinction of the giant ape. Yes, there are speculations that a predilection solely for bamboo, combined with increasing competition from more agile humans, eventually led to the extinction of Gigantopithecus. But some scientists saw an even closer connection between Gigantopithecus and humans. Among them was anthropologist Franz Wiedenreich in 1937. 
That is, shortly after finding the first teeth of Gigantopithecus, he exaggerated their similarity to human teeth and began to consider these apes direct ancestors of humans. He put forward the theory that Gigantopithecus, having appeared in India, evolved into the now extinct primates Meganthropus, which lived in South Asia in early Pleistocene. And then Meganthropus supposedly spread to southern China, where they split into two branches. One got to the island of Java and evolved into a Pithecanthrope and later into a human. The other moved to the north of China and turned into Peking Man, that is, into the Asian branch of Homo erectus, and then into a human of present-day type. But as we already know, thanks to DNA analysis, this is not true. Although the hypothesis of Wiedenreich was criticized even before that, because judging by the structure of the teeth and their size, Gigantopithecus still could not be ancestors of humans, even ancient. Some scientists believe that humans and Gigantopithecus lived side by side for a shorter period of time, 500,000 years. About 800,000 years ago, Homo erectus arrived in Southeast Asia, and Gigantopithecus became extinct about 300,000 years ago. While roaming the same land as Gigantopithecus, you would have also encountered Eleuropoda bocconi. This is the largest known ancestor of the great panda. It was larger than its descendants. Scientists don't know much about it, although the fossils that have been found date back to the late Pleistocene. Eleuropoda bocconi may have eaten meat, or it may have already started shifting to a vegetarian diet. This is not known for certain. The one that was definitely a meat eater is Megatherian, a genus of saber-toothed cat. It lived from the early Pliocene to the middle Pleistocene, that is from 5.3 to 1.3 million years ago. The largest specimens with an estimated body mass of 90 to 150 kilograms, 198 to 331 pounds, were found in India. Megantherian was the size of a medium-sized leopard, about 70 to 75 centimeters, 27.5 to 29.5 inches in height, and had massive forelimbs and claws like those of lions. At the end of the Pliocene, about 2.58 million years ago, it evolved into the larger Smilodon. It is not entirely clear how exactly it killed its prey. Instead of having conical fangs like modern cats, it had long upper fangs, flattened at the sides, and relatively small lower fangs. But it is known that it could still hold a fairly large prey and hunted large arteriodactyls, horses, young rhinoceroses, and elephants. The ancestors of man, Homo erectus, could also perish in the grasp of this dangerous predator. Gigantopithecus was hardly on the menu of the Megantherion. But let's get back to Gigantopithecus. Sometimes, the higher a species gets in evolution in terms of size, the harder it falls. And Gigantopithecus was, as you remember, bloody big. Surely, there are certain advantages of big size. Such an animal is less vulnerable to predators and can cover more territory in search of food. Gigantopithecus lived in the rainforests of present-day southern China for six to nine million years. But according to one study, about 100,000 years ago, at the beginning of the last Pleistocene Ice Age, they became extinct because their size became a fatal constraint to the new climate. According to Hervé Bocharens, a researcher at Tübingen University in Germany, due to their size, Gigantopithecus apparently depended on large amounts of food. When more and more forests turned into savannas during the Pleistocene period, the giant ape simply couldn't get enough food. The fruit-eating Gigantopithecus failed to adapt to the grass, roots, and leaves that were the main source of food in the new habitat. If it had been smaller, it might have been able to survive somehow. For example, orangutans, which are relatives of this giant ape, survived because 
they have slow metabolisms and can settle for small amounts of food. That is, over time, large size brings fewer benefits. It incurs short-term advantages and long-term risks. It's not just that the big guys need more food. The bigger an animal gets, the fewer babies it tends to have. That is, the population decreases and becomes more sensitive to external changes. As a result, changes in weather or climate that threaten a food source can reduce the population of large species to the point of degradation where extinction begins. In other words, the rate of extinction increases with the size of the species. This could be the reason why giants like Gigantopithecus and giant sloths no longer roam the earth. Every animal species has an upper limit of how big it can get, how close to the edge of the abyss it can come before falling into it. And here you might have a reasonable question. What about the dinosaurs? These giants have existed successfully for tens of millions of years. Why couldn't Gigantopithecus follow their example? Don't forget that dinosaurs were reptiles. Gigantopithecus were mammals. Our answer is that these two classes of animals have very different metabolisms and different lifestyles. According to another theory, it was fruits that killed Gigantopithecus. Chinese scientists have analyzed 17 teeth of Gigantopithecus that were discovered relatively recently. These teeth are less than 400,000 years old. That is, it's one of the youngest remains of these apes found. And here are the conclusions the scientists came to. Many teeth were clearly damaged during their lifetime. This indicates nutritional problems. So something was wrong before the Gigantopithecus became extinct. And this may have been related to food. As you remember, many believe that these giant apes first ate bamboo. This assumption was made because their teeth were adapted to chewing plant food. And also because the remains of pandas, whose favorite food is bamboo shoots, were found near their remains. So it seems that Gigantopithecus had to adjust their diet as the climate got colder and bamboo became rare. That's probably when they switched to fruit, which is rich in enamel-degrading acids. Maybe they didn't exactly die out because of this drastic change in diet, but their teeth were seriously damaged. So is there a clear-cut answer to the question of why Gigantopithecus became extinct? Paleontologists say that the hardest part is to understand why the animal disappeared. Sometimes it can be linked to an event, such as an asteroid impact or emergence of a new species in the ecosystem. But no single event seems to bring a clue to paleontologists in the case of Gigantopithecus. The best answer might be it was due to habitat loss. But today there isn't much evidence to support that. Another theory is the emergence of a new strain of disease that became fatal to Gigantopithecus. The situation may have worsened further due to a small population with a limited gene pool, resulting in less genetic diversity. But this theory is argued against by three separate species of Gigantopithecus, which were quite different genetically. So unless the disease was particularly persistent and dangerous, this theory is improbable. Most likely, there was more than one cause. A series of small events can affect a population, and together they would cause the same devastating effects as one large sudden event. For example, the emergence of Homo erectus didn't have an immediate impact on Gigantopithecus, but it did mean that food became scarce, as did other resources such as sheltered places. And when food became scarce, competition between species for the little remaining food intensified, and those that couldn't compete got closer and closer to extinction. Gigantopithecus would have had to compete with many species that ate the same food as it did. And when those animals ate the few food available, it would starve. And that's when its enormous size played against it. A big guy like that, as you remember, is not easy to keep fed. And judging by the fossil evidence, Gigantopithecus did suffer from undernutrition. Of course, this is all just a theory. No one can say for sure what really happened. With that said, the extinction could have been a gradual process whereby the population was critically reduced. 
Alternatively, the weakened population could have been finished off by some event like disease or a major ecosystem disruption. Gigantopithecus no longer roam the Earth. However, we live side by side with their close relatives. And many of them are also under threat of extinction. But this time, the human factor plays an even bigger role, as deforestation is also killing their habitat. Yet the size of these relatives is not comparable to that of the Gigantopithecus. Most of the endangered species are found in Madagascar. These include the Bemanasi mouse lemur. It was discovered in 2016 by a team of scientists from the German Primate Research Center. The length of the mouse lemurs, including the tail, does not exceed 27 centimeters, 10.6 inches. So they are the smallest of primates. They are omnivorous. They feed on insect excreta, small vertebrates, arthropods, fruit, resin, flowers, nectar, as well as buds and leaves. Another species at risk is the Rondo Dwarf Gallego. This little fellow weighs less than 100 grams, 3.5 ounces. It has large eyes and ears and a long tail, which unlike this part of the body in other Galagos, resembles a bottle brush. It is red when an individual is young, but gradually darkens. Also, this little one makes a unique sound consisting of two notes. The first is higher and can be repeated up to six times. Rondo Gallego lives in Tanzania and feeds mainly on insects as well as fruits and flowers. It is active at night and rests during the day. It gives birth to one or two cubs. The next distant relative of Gigantopithecus is the Rollaway monkey. It is an endangered species of old world monkey living in tropical West Africa. It is endangered due to habitat loss and hunting of these monkeys for bush meat. A special feature of these monkeys is their long beard. Fur is mostly black, but the neck and the inside of the arms are white, while the thighs and back are red. This monkey reaches 100 to 145 centimeters, 39 to 57 inches in length, and weighs 4 to 7 kilograms, 8.8 .8 to 15.4 pounds. It is an aboriginal species that lives in groups of 15 to 30 individuals, they feed on fruit, seeds, flowers, and insects. Next in line are the Delacours langurs. They live in Vietnam and are named for French ornithologist Jean Delacour. Their body length ranges from 139 centimeters to 150 centimeters, 55 to 59 inches, together with the tail. Their fur is mostly black with white markings on the face. But the most distinctive part is the rump area and the outside of the hind limbs. It is creamy white. They feed mainly on leaves. In addition, they may also eat fruits, flowers, and seeds. Langurs walk on the ground and only climb trees occasionally. They live up to 20 years. Interestingly, their cubs are red and only start to turn darker at the age of four months. The main threats to langurs are habitat destruction and hunting, since they are used in local folk medicine. Some apes on this list are closer in size to Gigantopithecus, and that's the eastern lowland gorilla. They lived in the rainforests of eastern Congo. As of 2016, there were only 3,800 of them, while the western lowland gorillas number about 100,000. These are the largest subspecies of gorillas and the largest modern primates. They are mostly black in color, with only mature males having a silver stripe on their back. Body weight averages 160 kilograms, or 353 pounds, for males, although it can go up to 220 kilograms, or 485 pounds. Females weigh far less, 70 to 114 kilograms, 154 to 251 pounds. The height of these gorillas is 185 centimeters, 73 inches, and 150 centimeters, 59 inches, respectively. They eat roots, bark, leaves, wood, flowers, plant stems, fruits, and occasionally invertebrates and mushrooms. And they are on the brink of survival. 
Because of the development of agriculture in recent decades and the killing of gorillas for meat, and most importantly, orangutans, the closest relatives of Gigantopithecus, are also under the threat of extinction due to the destruction of their habitat, deforestation, and poaching of cubs. According to WWF, the population of Bornean and Sumatran orangutans has declined dramatically. A century ago, the total number of orangutans probably totaled more than 230,000. But now, the Bornean orangutan population is estimated at about 104,700 and the Sumatran orangutan at about 7,500 individuals. And a third species of orangutan was classified in November 2017. With no more than 800 individuals, the Tupanuli orangutan is the most endangered of all great apes. Of course, this is by far not a full list of primates related to Gigantopithecus that are endangered. But these examples give an idea of what's going on on the ape population in our time. We've just covered the successors to the Gigantopithecus. However, not everybody believes that these giant apes are extinct. Some believe they still roam the earth to this day, just known as abominable snowmen, Yeti, Bigfoot, or Sasquatch. It has many names. Bigfoot enthusiasts believe it may be the missing link between apes and humans. Some promote the idea that it is a descendant of the Gigantopithecus Blackie. The others argue with them and believe that this giant ape is not related to humans. Anyway, the descriptions of Bigfoot do have something in common with Gigantopithecus. It is usually described as a large, muscular, and bipedal human-like creature covered in black, dark brown, or dark red hair. Further descriptions include broad shoulders, long arms, and absence of a neck. It is approximately 1.8 to 2.7 meters, 6 to 9 feet tall, and in some cases reaches 3 to 4.6 meters, 10 to 15 feet. It is believed that his face resembles more human than ape. These creatures also appear in folk legends passed down from generation to generation. Today, there are numerous pieces of evidence of alleged Bigfoot encounters. Eyewitness reports, photographs and plaster casts of footprints, eventual hair samples and sound records. But the most famous is the 1967 Patterson-Gimlin film, which supposedly captured a female Bigfoot walking away from the camera. However, the video later proved to be, to put it mildly, non-documentary. In the 1950s, theories emerged that stories about Bigfoot were actually descriptions of encounters with the relict population of Gigantopithecus, which survived thanks to isolation from the changing world around it. Supporters of the idea of connections between Bigfoot and Gigantopithecus include Jeffrey Bourne and Grover Krantz. As you remember, he was one who believed that Gigantopithecus was bipedal. According to Bourne, Gigantopithecus could have migrated, following many other animal species, through the Bering Land Bridge to America. However, no fossils have been found there. And in Asia, as you know, the scientists discovered only jaws and teeth. Anthropologist Matthew Cartmill criticizes the Gigantopithecus Blackie hypothesis. His main point was that the Bigfoot described by eyewitnesses is an upright walking bipedal creature with a long, thick thumb. And this description doesn't match Gigantopithecus. In addition, the legs and gait of the Bigfoot should be similar to those of humans. But the great apes have completely different feet. They had elongated opposite big toes, which helped them to hold objects with their feet. Why do proponents of the hypotheses refuse to abandon it? The thing is that all of the evidence for the existence of Bigfoot is unconvincing. Eyewitnesses are accused of having seen a different creature or 
of even just making things up. And in the Patterson Gremlin movie, we actually see a man in a monkey suit. So, when Gigantopithecus emerged on the scene, many researchers considered it as scientific evidence. That is, they tried to unite the fossilized remains of Gigantopithecus with Bigfoot folklore. Kranz even tried to identify Bigfoot as a new species of Gigantopithecus. Gigantopithecus candensis, that is, from Canada, but his attempt was unsuccessful. Most likely, Gigantopithecus was a large ape, resembling an orangutan, and it is neither the mysterious Sasquatch from the legends, nor the lost and found link between humans and apes. What do you think? Is there a connection between Bigfoot and Gigantopithecus?